Hello everyone. If you're like me, you must be getting amped up for the Halloween season. Hopefully these stories can put you in the mood. Let's drift further into Mr. Creep's mind. There was a strange door in the middle of an aisle in the grocery store. I went through it. Written by Weird Bryce Guy. I was apparently the only one who could see the door. I looked around, expecting to everyone to be gawking at this suddenly appeared as structure, but no one seemed to notice it. Everyone went about their business, completely ignorant to the steel rectangle in the middle of the aisle. My first thoughts were, of course, that I had, somehow, gone crazy, was suffering from some suddenly onset psychological issue. Acting in accordance with this thought, I proceeded to walk ahead, thinking I would pass through the door, hoping that, upon seeing it, it was just some sort of mirage, and it would then disappear. But I instead walked right into the door, smacking my face on the cold metal surface. I cried out and nearly fell back. Tears welled in my eyes, and my nose burned. A few nearby shoppers turned and saw me, and knowing that they couldn't see the door, I quickly blurted out that there had been a bug on my face and I had slapped it away. Confused smiles and raised eyebrows were the only responses. While pretending to compare two boxes of oatmeal, I tried to regain my composure and study the strange, certifiably physical door. There was a curved metal handle, and the door was rimmed by a slightly darker, rusted threshold. Its height was about 10 feet, with maybe 4 inches. Peering past it, I saw only the rest of the aisle. There was no indication, outwardly at least, that it led anywhere. It was as if someone had simply plopped a model door in the middle of the grocery store. Reason told me to just move along, to forget about it, and perhaps make an appointment with a psychologist or a neurologist. I tried to think of an incident or issue in my life that might have precipitated door-based delusions, but I could think of nothing. My natural human curiosity, however, compelled me to investigate. I had come into the store with the intention of buying banana peppers, arugula, pizza dough, provolone cheese, and sausage to make a delicious homemade pizza. But instead, I stumbled upon, or rather walked into, a bizarre phenomenon, one that begged to be investigated. Returning the oatmeal to their shelves, and shaking my head to theatrically express my feigned disappointment in both, I ambled up to the door, and I gripped the knob. There was a no getting around the gesture. Couldn't think of a non-obvious way to perform the action. To any observer, it would have looked like I was grasping at nothing. And taking a deep breath, Excited yet anxious, I opened the door. There was a moderately lit corridor ahead. Its source of illumination wasn't immediately obvious. There were no lights on the ceiling or walls. At the very end was what looked like another door, but this one was closed too. And yet, I could see the space ahead, 
with decent enough clarity. There was nothing visually strange or unusual about the corridor, and yet I nonetheless felt an eeriness about it. Got the impression that the corridor existed elsewhere, was not as mundane as its featureless surfaces would have you believe. Even as anxiety mounted within me, I decided to step through the threshold to enter that grey-walled hall and venture through the second door beyond. I don't know why I felt the desire to proceed so strongly. I could have just closed the door, walked away, but an almost mortal curiosity it impelled me onwards, and so I went through. I crossed through the threshold and stepped onto the immaculately clean, curiously tiled floor. I hadn't noticed the oddly head-shaped pattern from outside, and for some reason, this unsettled me. These heads had no features at all, nothing which would have indicated that they had been modeled based on something, and yet I was certain that they were heads, blank faces imprinted upon the floor. The walls and ceiling, however, had kept these same appearances unblemished stretches of light gray. And turning around, I saw with a sudden spike of anxiety that the space behind me, it was entirely empty. The door had disappeared. The hall stretched back endlessly, a yawning rectangle of gray. I now had no other choice but to continue ahead and pass through the second door. I walked on, thinking to myself that the corridor seemed oddly narrow compared to the door that had led to it. I couldn't put both my arms completely out. I had to bend them in if I wanted both hands to touch the walls. For a reason I couldn't yet identify, I felt more comfortable walking like this sliding my hands along the walls. It wasn't until I had gone about 40 feet and had yet to make any substantial progress towards the door that I realized the degree of the bend in my arms had lessened. Before, they'd each been at around 120 degree angles, but now they were almost at 90. The corridor had somehow narrowed as I walked on, I made the disquieting observation that the corridor's narrowing was visually imperceptible. And it's hard to explain, but even though my arms continued to bend, the corridor remained visually unchanged. It appeared no different from when I had first entered it. Turning around, I received the same impression. And yet, the space between the walls had undeniably decreased. Looking up, I almost cried out in shock. The ceiling had also inexplicably lowered itself. It was now only perhaps two or three feet from the top of my head. And yet the door seemed only infinitesimally closer. Eventually... The narrowing increased to such a severity that I could track the spatial tightening with each step. My arms now bent by two or three degrees per step. My anxiety flared horribly, threatening to shut down my mind. But the door had drawn closer, and this observation was the only thing that kept me from fainting. I could have probably figured out how many steps I had before movement became impossible and estimated how many steps were required to reach the door. But in that awful moment, trapped in some unreal hallway, I didn't want to do the math and come up short. 
I knew that if these steps required exceeded the amount that I could take, that I would certainly lose my mind. When I reached the point where I could no longer hold out my arms, I started to cry. Walking slowly, hands at my sides, I again reflected back on my life, this time trying to recall some moment of misbehavior or moral turpitude which might have explained my enclosure in the ever-narrowing corridor. I again failed to think of something appropriately heinous. I had done nothing to warrant this cosmically cruel and nightmarish experience. When the corridor became so narrow that I had to turn sideways and silo between the walls, I think I lost a decent portion of my sanity. Despite the strain on my neck, I kept my head turned toward the door, knowing that to face the walls would only worsen my fright, would send me into a state of full-blown terror, during which I would probably just break down and insensibly weep. The door was now maybe 20 feet ahead. I had covered a bit over half the distance. I focused my thoughts on reaching the door, ignored the mental math my mind tried to do in regards to the distance and how much time I had left. My brain did its best to reconcile the discontinuity between my visual impression of the hall, which was still unchanged, and the physical sensations of the walls and ceiling upon my body. About five feet away, I had to start exerting considerable effort to move. Despite the ever-lowering ceiling, crouching was an impossibility due to the close proximity of the walls. I simply could not bend my knees. With my body compressed by the implicable concrete, my breathing became labored. Had I not been so tightly compacted between the walls, I would have still struggled to breathe. The unbridled anxiety, bringing about its own respiratory difficulties. I felt dizzy, almost drunk. A sensation exacerbated by the still present incongruity between what I saw ahead of me and what I felt around me. Two feet away, my head felt like it was going to burst. Every inch was a bodily effort. Tears streamed on my face, squeezed out of my eyes by the unrelievable pressure. I hyperventilated. I could no longer think clearly, evidenced by a sudden need to say door out loud, as if to remind myself of my obvious goal. I was barely conscious when my hand reached the knob. My entire body was just a bundle of agony. I was beyond the anxiety of extreme claustrophobia, something I hadn't previously been affected by. I was now only a flickering ember of will, a simply-minded organism existing for one purpose, to escape the narrowing corridor. With some miraculously untapped reserve of strength, I turned the knob with my fingers. Thankfully, mercifully, the door opened outward. Beyond the threshold, I saw the packed shelves of the grocery store. This sight renewed my spirit and somewhat lessened the fog in my mind. But I pushed on. Even as the walls pressed monstrously against my body. Fingers free. Then a hand then an entire arm, then my head. I breathed in the abundant air, uncaring of whether or not other shoppers noticed me, now free to move with a little more motion. I gripped the threshold and tugged at the rest of my body. Gazing down the corridor, I saw that the space behind me was at least in accordance with these circumstances. The opposing walls were almost a single surface, differentiated by a partition of empty space only about a foot wide, between which the rest of my body was horribly sandwiched. Halfway out of the concrete jaws, 
halfway into the wonderfully spacious real world. I pulled with all my human might. When only an arm remained in the space, I put a foot against the threshold for leverage and exerted one last, almost Herculean effort, to withdraw myself from the hungry corridor. And just before my arm had slipped free, I felt a completely new sensation. Before my hand cleared the unsettlingly small gap, I felt something grip my wrist. It had not been the walls, closing in with some unprecedented rapidity and taking on a wholly new sensation. There was the clear impression of a hand wrapping itself around my wrist. And not only that, but the hand seemed to briefly resist my efforts, as if to try and pull me toward the closing corridor. Breathless, aching all over, I watched as the walls noiselessly came together, became a seamless, concrete surface. Nothing else happened. The door remained open. Only now the corridor beyond was inaccessible. Exhausted and pained, but immensely relieved. I closed the door and I leaned against the shelves. People passed me and I saw a few of them grimace or whisper to others. Glancing down, I understood why. I was a mess. My clothes were now mangled and dusty. My skin was red, and I'm sure my hair looked gross, disheveled and matted with sweat. But I didn't care. I had escaped the corridor, and whatever had sought at that last moment to keep me there. Eventually, I regained a bit of my strength and continued on with my shopping, forsaking but not forgetting the door. No one else seemed to notice its presence. But part of me now thinks that I'm not the only one who has gone through. That maybe others have explored its deceptive corridor. And now simply ignore it for their own peace of mind. Have you seen it? I was asked to watch over a house for the weekend. They left a strange list of rules. Written by a traditional ad. I am in my last year of high school. Now, most of my friends and classmates by now have already gotten some kind of job. Whether that's working at a fast food place or even helping their own parents with a little business they had set up themselves. I was one of the few who just couldn't manage to get a job. Every application I sent out was merely received with the usual copy and paste reply that summed up to, you weren't chosen. But I had to get money in some way. That's what led to me to start making and setting up flyers for a sort of house-sitting service. As old school as it seemed, a lot of my neighbors were usually going away on various trips, and very few of them leave their houses alone. So, they would usually call up a friend or someone they knew to look after things. To be honest, I wasn't expecting to really get any offers for that reason. That was until I got a call from a friend of mine. To keep it brief, they called because he and his parents would be going out of town for the Easter weekend, and their usual house sitter had recently bailed. They almost canceled the trip until they saw my flyer. I accepted the offer and was told to go to his house early in the morning on Friday to give me the basic rundown of what to do and how to take care of things. Thankfully, they were bringing their dog with them for the trip, so I wouldn't need to worry about that. I got to the house at around 6.30 in the morning on Friday. My friend was already waiting for me at the front door of the house to give me the standard tour. To provide a little detail, the house itself was a standard one-story suburban home. From the front door, there was the living room which held a reclining, sand-colored couch facing a large, flat-screen TV. From the living room, straight ahead from the front door, led into the kitchen to the immediate right, and a large dining room ahead. The kitchen had a door that led into a laundry room, and the dining room led to three other areas. Midway through the dining room, there was an alcove that had three doors, 
More for a few kind of the towel closet beside the door straight ahead from the alcove entrance. That door led to the guest bathroom. And to the left was a room filled with various creative supplies and materials. To the right was the den, which had a second TV and a computer within. And at the end of the dining room were a set of glass doors leading to the back porch. The blinds were half closed, so I was able to see a little bit of the backyard as well. And to the left of that was my friend's room, and to the right was his parents' room, or the master bedroom as others would call it. After the tour and a basic rundown on what needed to be done, my friend waved me goodbye before heading off with his parents. I decided to check over each room before heading away myself. They had told me to come by each morning and each evening to check over the house and tidy things up if needed. They left me their phone number in case anything went wrong, although I wasn't expecting anything to really happen. As I was checking the kitchen, my eyes caught a glimpse of what seemed like an envelope of some kind resting in the middle of the granite countered island at the center of the kitchen. I picked it up, assuming it was just some mail from their other family members, until I saw what was written on the front. In black, pen ink, it read, Additional House Rules. I thought to myself that there might be some other things that they may be used to with their usual house sitter that they wouldn't want me to do as well. I opened up the envelope and unfolded the paper inside. I was not expecting what I was about to read. On the paper, it read as follows. Additional House Rules Rule 1. Arrive in into the house at the exact same time each morning and evening. No exceptions. Rule 2. Make sure any and all doors of any kind are closed. If you find a door opened and you don't remember opening it, close it and avoid entering that room for at least 5 minutes. Rule 3. If anyone calls the house phone past 7pm, do not answer it, even if it's our own number. Rule 4. Keep the alcove light and the master bedroom lights on while you're inside the house. Other lights are optional to keep on. However, if any of the lights you turned on happen to turn off for any reason, go to the alcove or master bedroom until the lights turn on again. Rule 5. During your evening check, do not leave the house at any time between 7 and 7.30. Past those times, you may leave at any time. Rule 6. Close the blinds to the backyard before doing anything else during the evening. Do not look out into the backyard for any reason. These rules read to me more like some kind of safety manual more than one standard rule set. I honestly thought it was some kind of joke that my friend wanted to play on me before he had left. Regardless, I kept the list and I headed out for the day. I arrived at 6.45 that night for the evening checkup. I entered the house and began looking around the house for anything out of place as instructed. The house was brightly lit, as I had turned every light on so that I could see. Any doors were closed so I had to open them to check inside. It wasn't until I had reached my friend's room when I started noticing anything unusual. The door to his room was cracked open, unlike the other doors of the house so far. As I approached the room, I began to hear what sounded like scratching at the door. And before I got within arm's reach of the door, the light in that room flickered very slightly before abruptly shutting off. I began to back away from the door, just as it began to slowly creak open. I backed into the door leading to the master bedroom and I quickly bolted in, closing the door behind me. The creaking of my friend's room door stopped, and for a good 10 seconds, it was a dead silent. The only sound was that of my own slow breathing, and then I began to hear slow-moving footsteps coming from the room. 
They slowly approached the door to the master bedroom, of which I was right behind. I looked under the door in hopes that I could see who or what it was, but there was nothing. I saw a shadow stretching slightly into the room from under the door, as if something was there, yet my eyes saw absolutely nothing. I then began to hear the scratching that I had heard earlier, now coming from behind the door. I had no idea what to do. What could I even do? Whatever it was, I couldn't even see it. Eventually, after about five long minutes, the scratching abruptly stopped. The shadow under the door was gone. I hesitated before cracking the door open to peek inside of the room. My friend's room was lit up once again, and the door was wide open. I checked the door that I was cowered behind, and there was no evidence that anything had ever been there, let alone had been scratching at the door. I checked the time on my phone. It read 7.05pm. I stepped out into the dining room and noticed that the blinds to the backyard weren't closed. I went over to close them, but not before catching a glimpse of the outside. Out in the backyard was a tall, animalistic, shadowed figure. Its appearance almost looked like an eight-foot-tall deer standing on its back legs. It turned its gaze towards mine. On what I assume is its face were three bright purple eyes staring right at me. I took no time in closing the blinds at the moment that it looked at me, hoping that I would be safe from whatever it was that was out there. My phone read at 7.17pm when I heard the home phone ring. I was about to go over to answer it before I remembered one of the additional rules. Rule number three. If anyone calls the house phone past 7pm, do not answer it, even if it's our own number. At this point, I was willing to follow these rules to the letter. I had already had a few close calls due to me nearly not following these strange guidelines. So, I let the phone ring on a few more times before it went straight to voicemail, and I let out a sigh of relief. My phone read at 7.31pm. I decided to start heading home. I was shaken by what I had seen, as I had no clue if it was all some kind of nightmare. But it wasn't a nightmare. It was very real. I hardly got any sleep that night, and by morning, I was running late for the morning check. I drove down to the house and went up to the front door. I was about to unlock the door before I began to hear scratching behind the door. I froze up, not moving. I remembered the first rule. Arrive and enter at the same time each morning and evening. I decided to back away to my car. I wasn't sure what was behind the door, but I didn't want to find out. I got into my car and began to pull away. Just before I started driving away from the entrance, I saw those three purple eyes from the front window of the house, gazing at me just as I drove off. That evening, I arrived at 6.45 to the site of my friend's car in the driveway. Confused, I got out walked up to the front door and rang the doorbell. After a minute, my friend answered the door and greeted me with his usual smile. You guys are back early. I spoke, confused. Ah, oh, right, my friend answered. Our family couldn't all make it to my grandparents' Easter dinner, so we had to head home early. I nodded as he handed me the money that I was promised. He wished me a good night and was about to close the door before I remembered the note. By the way, I began to ask, What was this note about? What's up with your house? He looked at me, confused for a second before he got a look of realization in his eyes. He chuckled to himself before he answered, I didn't really expect you to take that little joke seriously. What do you mean? I replied. I just left that there to mess with you, man. He laughed. None of that was anything you needed to worry about. It's been one day since I looked after my friend's house. The events of that night, even now, are still as clear as day. 
At first, I thought it was all just some kind of nightmare that I had as a result of reading that list of house rules. And yet it couldn't have been just a nightmare, and it was this day when I found that out. I got back to my house on Saturday around 7.15 in the morning. I, still being in a state of being half asleep and shaken up from last night's encounter, didn't realize until I got into my house that I had kept the paper that had these strange set of rules in my pocket. I pulled out the now crumpled up sheet of paper, just to make sure that the rules that I saw were real. While I expected the original list of rules, instead, my eyes saw a new list of rules. They read as follows. Additional House Rules Rule 1. Keep the front blinds of the house closed at all times. If you find them open for any reason, close them immediately. Rule 2. If you hear knocking on the front door at any time between noon and 1pm, or between 5.30pm and 7pm, do not answer it. Do not look outside. Do not respond to any voice that may be behind the door. Rule 3. Avoid looking outside between 8pm and 6am. If you happen to look outside during those hours, close your eyes and turn the other direction. Stay like that for at least 10 seconds before leaving the room that you're in. Avoid that room until 6 a.m. Rule 4. If you are awake at 1.30 a.m. and you hear the sound of scratching, stay still. Do not move until the scratching stops. If instead of scratching, you hear something approaching you, hold your breath and stay still until you hear it leave. Rule 5. Listen closely to any room you are about to enter. If you hear nothing after at least 5 seconds, you're safe. However, if you hear breathing, avoid entering until it goes silent. Close the door if it isn't already. They changed. The rules changed, I thought to myself. I rolled the paper into a tight ball and threw it into the trash can in the kitchen. I hoped that it would nullify the rules in some way. When I turned around, I nearly backed into the trash can and knocked it over when I saw the paper on the kitchen table. Not only was it there, but it was back in pristine condition. I knew that I had no choice. I had to deal with these rules, no matter what. It was 12.30 in the afternoon. I was attempting to take my mind off the list by watching some TV when I heard a knock at the front door. I began to approach the door when I stopped myself. I heard another knock at the door. I simply stood there, unmoving as if thinking that whatever was knocking on the door would stop if I simply didn't move. I heard a third knock at the door after only a few moments. I held still, waiting until I heard nothing. Eventually, nothing came. No further knocking. I let out a long, relieved sigh, not realizing that I had held my breath for the duration of that. I leaned over to check the front blinds. Closed. I headed into the kitchen to refresh myself of the rules, making sure that I had made the right choice. Later that night, around 7.30, I had started to wind down for the evening. Nothing had happened other than the knocking, and I thought that I was in the clear. I approached my bedroom door and started to open it, when I heard a very faint, ragged breathing from behind the door. Immediately, I slammed the door shut and I pressed my ear against it. I heard that ragged, animalistic breathing right behind the door, almost as if whatever was there was waiting for me as much as I was waiting for it. After a short time, I heard the breathing begin to retreat away and vanish. 
After which, I cracked the door open to see if I was actually safe. I saw nothing, and I got myself settled into sleep. I woke up suddenly during the night. The clock on my nightstand read 1.30 in the morning. I started looking around my pitch black room when I began to hear a faint scratching near the foot of my bed. I stayed completely still, just as I remembered. Eventually, the scratching stopped, and I began to sigh in relief when I started to hear the creaking of the floorboards slowly approaching the left side of my bed. Almost like footsteps, I immediately held my breath, facing the ceiling and staying still. I moved my line of sight in the direction of the footsteps, and what I saw nearly made me release my breath. A tall, deer-like figure stood hunched over my bed. Its entire body was darker than the room, almost like I was staring at something made from the void itself. Where its face was supposed to be were three luminescent, deep purple eyes staring right into mine. It began to climb out of my bed, its thin, almost skeletal limbs on either side of my body like prison bars. One thing that was truly strange about this was the fact that it didn't seem to make any indentation in the mattress, despite its overwhelming stature. Its dark face was mere inches from mine, breathing slow, ragged breaths as it seemed to almost judge me. I just kept my breath held and stayed perfectly still, hoping that it would go away soon. It soon climbed off my bed and stalked out of my bedroom. Once it did, I released my breath and I passed out. That morning, I got up and went to the kitchen to get some breakfast. I continued my morning as normal, or at least as normal as it could be regarding the last encounter. I went to school, bringing the rule list with me without thinking too much about it. Thankfully, nothing happened during the day. I didn't bring up anything that had happened during the night to any of my friends, not even bringing up the note at all. It was only when I got home that afternoon that I found out that the paper with the rules on it was now gone. I've been staring at my telescope for three months straight. I can't stop. Written by Sci-Fi Writer 3592 I was hired by a very wealthy billionaire who invested a considerable amount of money into the construction of his very own telescope. Oh, I'm not talking about your generic backyard telescope. This one may be James Webb Space Telescope, look like a child's play toy. You could see up to several billion light years away with full clarity. Heck, you could spot a single quarter onto the surface of the moon if you had to. This telescope was a technological marvel that must have required a significant amount of funding and resources. You could actually zoom into specific star systems within the galaxy. They launched several space telescopes in order to get a full picture of all around our orbit. It was practically the wet dream of an astrophysicist. Luckily for me, I was lucky enough to get into MIT and work in several laboratories with highly credible researchers. I graduated with over 20 publications and I got offered a paid PhD position that skyrocketed my career. I was sought out by NASA and as much as I really, really wanted to be with them, the pay was pretty much garbage, and they were pretty underfunded. So, being hired and given free reign of an entire telescope 
it was an automatic yes for me. The makeup of my team is pretty irrelevant, but it consisted of five other members that were not as equally qualified as me. My first couple of days analyzing the night skies were pretty exciting, almost exhilarating. I recorded hundreds of galaxies and wormholes that weren't discovered yet. There was one specific galaxy though that had caught my eye. It was located behind the Canis Major Dwarf, obstructed by the light of our closest neighbor. It had the appearance of a massive galaxy similar to the Milky Way, yet its solar systems were becoming misaligned. It was as if the galaxy's gravity that contained its systems had started weakening, causing thousands of galaxies to start scattering into the void of space. Out of curiosity, I started recording and analyzing the different solar systems within the galaxy. I managed to record five solar systems with habitable planets for future purposes. I couldn't think of a suitable name for the newfound galaxy, so I decided to leave it for another time. I had too much on my plate with presentations, data checking, and publications. And besides, I had too many names to name my galaxy. I was stuck between choosing a Greek, Roman, or even naming it after yours truly. I saved the files and went back to working on my other projects. It must have been a full week before I was able to go back to accessing the telescope. In between that time, I decided to name my newfound galaxy the Montalvo Star System. Upon returning to the telescope, however, I noticed some major abnormalities. Within my entire career, it was something I never saw nor heard of. What was once the Montalvo star system was reduced to a mere clusters of scattered solar systems. At first, I thought that I was looking at a different galaxy altogether. Perhaps it even got swallowed by a nearby wormhole. But the one planet I had recorded as a habitable planet, it was still there. I still didn't understand where the rest of these systems had gone. I even compared past photos that I had took of the entire galaxy. Within a week, entire solar systems had disappeared. I decided to zoom in on the remaining systems to examine them. The first three seemed uneventful. Just a couple of planets rotating around their corresponding star. However, the fourth one, it had something a little special. A type O star, one of the rarest stars known to man. These blue stars are so bright that they can be seen at great distances, and some can even be seen on Earth with the naked eye. They have such a mass that when they die, they end in such violent supernova explosions that they can lead to black holes or even neutron stars. Most stars just fade into oblivion. I was so in awe at this beautiful star that I almost missed the giant object traveling through an odd angle. It looked like it was going against the standard gravity of the star system and headed to a planet the size of Jupiter. 
it was horrifying. It was about the size of our sun. At first, I thought it was some sort of misaligned dwarf planet, given the strange movement and velocity as it circled around the planet. But the closer that I looked at it, the more organic it looked. It had large appendages, what I assume would be tentacles that wiggled everywhere, and it moved its body in a swaying motion like a whale swimming. I was left in complete bewilderment at the images that I was seeing. To my knowledge, there were no organisms that could live indefinitely in the vacuum of space. Even the microscopic tardigrades could only live approximately 10 days before the radiation kills them. What I was seeing would revolutionize the biology field. My name, it would be synonymous with the exploration of extraterritorial organisms. I zoomed in to get a closer look and could see that it opened some sort of flap and started releasing bigger tentacles from what I assumed to be its mouth. It started penetrating the planet and I'm assuming it must have started absorbing the planet for nutrients. I'm not sure how its digestive system worked, but it must have somehow evolved to break down every possible element to sustain itself. It took a matter of hours, but soon enough, the planet it was reduced to nothing as it was devoured by the gigantic titan. In only a couple of days, the titan devoured the rest of the solar system, including the sun. Its act of eating the sun was fascinating. It must have produced some strange liquid component that it used to extinguish the flames of the fiery star. Its body, it must have adapted to the incredulous amounts of radiation to be able to withstand the temperatures of any star at such a close range. When the star dimmed, I tried to locate the beast, but I had lost it in the void. Instead, I located the nearest solar system I deemed as Marana. The solar system wouldn't have caused me to blink an eye. It looked pretty ordinary. One star with five circulating planets. It wasn't until I saw several lights on the planet's surface that it caught my eye. It was the fourth planet away from its star that had several lights in a grid-like pattern, similar to that of Earth when seen from a distance. It couldn't be, but it was. This mysterious planet had some semblance of a very advanced alien civilization. I was getting ready to jot down some more notes when I noticed something very peculiar. A sudden bombardment of smaller lights started leaving the planet's surface in a very organized pattern. It was like they were sending out ships. Thousands and thousands of very little dots, from my angle, started making a protective stance around their home planet. I watched in fascination as they merely circulated around their planet. It was like they were ready for something. I waited for a couple of hours, when all of a sudden, some weird portal opened up in the middle of Marana. It's difficult to describe, but between the edge of the Morana solar system 
and the fifth planet. A hole similar to the shape of when water drains opened up, releasing small bits of what I could describe as pure plasmic energy. This time, two of the titans I encountered earlier emerged from the hole. I'm pretty sure that one of them was the same one that had devoured the solar system from before, but it brought along a smaller titan. I assumed that it must have been its offspring, but it raised further questions as to how that was even possible. Could it be that it reproduced asexually? How does it create those wormholes? I had so many questions circulate in my brain, but I was cut short by the events that started unfolding right in front of me. The smaller beast headed towards the fifth planet, while the larger beast moved towards the fourth planet. The alien ships must have tried firing every weapon they had, because flashes of light erupted all around the vicinity of the great beast. But I watched in mere horror as the Titan nearly waddled through the formation of ships like nothing. Instead, I saw the tentacles shoot off random projectiles that took some of them down like they were sentient themselves. The beast itself hovered over their planet and began releasing its large tentacles that must have penetrated deep within the planet. It only took a couple of hours for the entire ordeal to be over. It sent a chill down my spine. How could an entire civilization have been wiped out by one organism so giant? It didn't even acknowledge the billions of lives that it took. The idea that such a beast came into existence sent a dreadful feeling to my core. But I had to know more about it so I continued to monitor that sector of space. I didn't leave the observatory for weeks, getting to the point where my other co-workers started to complain about the smell. I had too much to do and not enough time. The updates that I kept sending over was nothing exciting. New galaxies that were discovered here and there, but I didn't send them anything groundbreaking yet. I kept that stuff to myself, for now. It took another couple of days for the beast to devour the Marana solar system, and as soon as its star went dark, I lost them to the void. They resurfaced in the nearest star system once again, this time bringing a third. This went on for another month. Each time a solar system would be completely devoured in a matter of days. When the stars went dark, they would use some sort of wormhole opening to pop up in a new star system and to bring in another one. They always traveled in three, and when they reached their capacity, they would send off the fourth one by themselves. As dreadful as it was to witness such acts, it paled in comparison to what I had discovered. I noticed that the path they were moving through was headed in our direction. When you consider the fact that the light that was reaching from their destination was about 30,000 light years away, the entire galaxy must have been devoured a long time ago. I was simply looking into the echoes of a violent past showing us our imminent future. Based on my calculations, which I had to take into account their exponential growth and the fact that they travel faster than anything we could ever think of, I estimate it'll be another year before the other scientists notice that the Canis Major Dwarf Galaxy will start to go dark. In two years, they'll have wiped out half the solar system within our reach. In three years, they'll hit our solar system. We don't have much time before our planet becomes another victim to the horrors of space. The progress and advancement of our technology isn't rapid enough to escape our inescapable fate. I decided to compile a full briefing towards the government space agency 
to raise alarms as to what I had discovered, but I had my credentials wiped and fired. Heck, they even threatened me with imprisonment if I spoke about it with anyone. However, the truth must be out there. They are coming, and they don't care about anything but quelling their hunger. There is something wrong with the woods near my house. Written by Sci-Fi Writer 3592 My family and I recently moved away from the city, settling in a gorgeous house in the middle of a developing neighborhood. Our house was one of the first to be built in the area. So, aside from a couple of other houses, there wasn't many people around yet. Instead, we were surrounded by a vast ocean of trees and greenery, untouched by the hand of man. I first noticed it when I left my house one morning to go on a run. I suffered from depression, an invisible illness that my parents never took seriously until they found me in the hospital drunk and disoriented. I had tried to throw myself in the middle of a busy road, ranting about wanting to end it all. Luckily for me, my friends were able to wrestle me down, and someone called an ambulance. That's one of the main reasons we moved so far away from the city, so we could spend more time as a family recovering. I was always restless, so I would often wake up at dusk and go on a jog to sort out my thoughts. I would grab my earbuds and a windbreaker and quietly enter in the security pin for the alarm system and head out. The air was cool and crispy, full of microscopic drops of the last night's storm. Although it was the middle of summer, it felt more like fall. I started off with a light jog, running down the street full of half-finished houses and out into the trees. The closest thing to nature I ever got was Central Park, back when we lived in the city. Unlike Central Park, however, there is no pavement full of cyclists or random tourists taking pictures everywhere. It was just me and the sounds of crickets, swaying trees and the cacophony of birds. Eventually, I got tired and decided to stop near a fallen tree. I leaned back against the log and sat down, taking a sip from my water bottle. I looked around a little before putting on my earbuds. As nice as nature was, my thoughts and memories were overpowering in the scenery. All I kept thinking about was the day our life turned to hell. It was barely a year since the incident, but I could still remember it like it was yesterday. My parents had to go out to work like always and I stayed home to take care of my little brother, Diego. I was in charge of watching him ever since I was little. I would wake him up, feed him, bathe him, and help him with his homework. I would drop him off on my way to school and pick him up. One morning, I woke up to find him still on the kitchen floor, surrounded by a mess of flour and other ingredients. He had tried to make some breakfast and choked on a slice of banana. He choked because I didn't wake up in time. His death was on me. And now my baby brother was gone. I was so deep in my thoughts that I didn't notice the music had stopped in my earbuds. Instead, being replaced by a faint static. Sissy, leave. A very faint and familiar voice had whispered through the static. It almost sounded like Diego's voice. I tried to raise the volume on my phone, but when I pulled my phone out, it shut off. I tried to turn it back on, but it only displayed the message of low battery. Weird. I always charge my phone overnight. I took off my earbuds and put them back in their case when I heard a branch snap to my right. I looked over and saw a little boy wearing Bob the Builder pajamas. It was Diego. It couldn't be. I had to be dreaming. His big innocent brown eyes stared up at me and with his finger, he motioned me to follow him. I wanted to follow him, but something wasn't right about this entire situation. The area had gone completely silent. The birds and even the insects had left. 
There wasn't even wind. The hairs in the back of my neck had started to stand up, and my heart was pounding faster. I looked away from his direction and I ran towards home. As I ran, I looked back and saw that the area was empty. I made it home, out of breath, but I didn't care, as long as I was away from that place. I spent the rest of the day distracting myself until my parents came home from work. And when they did, I didn't mention anything out of the ordinary. I didn't need to give them another reason to diminish their perspective of me. I laid in bed that night, thinking about what I saw. I probably dreamt it all. I was tired. It was probably grief. I kept thinking about ways to rationalize what I saw but I knew deep down that what I saw was real. And the next morning, I went downstairs into the kitchen where my parents were sitting down and making breakfast. So, how are you settling in? My father asked while scraping his fork around these scrambled eggs on his plate. We have another month before school starts. Your father and I were wondering if you wanted to go camping. My mother said awkwardly while stirring the spoon in her cup of coffee. She had a tendency to fidget when she was nervous. Yeah, it would be nice to do something as a family before you start school. Plus, we could explore this area a little bit. My father reiterated. If that's okay with you. My mother raising an eyebrow while taking a sip on her coffee. I merely nodded while sitting down to pick at the eggs in front of me. For a brief second, I remembered about yesterday's events but I was disrupted by my parents' awkward conversation. I think we should go this weekend. I checked the forecast and the weather should be perfect this weekend. I hear there's a campsite close by. My mother continued on while my father continued picking at his eggs. In that case, I think we should start packing and gathering up camping stuff. I think I'm going to run into town for a quick bit later today and get the rest of these supplies. Okay, my mom added, agreeing with my father. The rest of the day went by smoothly with my parents gone. I spent all day just lying in bed and going on social media. The clock app made it super easy for me to distract myself from the complete silence of the house. And when Diego was around, there was never any silence. He would always blast the TV or play really loud music. Now there's too much. I eventually drifted off to sleep. The next two days were the same as the previous ones. I would lay in bed browsing more social media, trying to distract myself from my own brain. Eventually, Friday arrived, and we soon found ourselves on the road on our way to the campsite my parents had talked about. The drive there wasn't that long but it felt like an eternity with the utter silence. If this was the way it was going to be, I was already counting down the seconds. The actual campsite was nothing special. It was a flat area with several wooden tables and empty fire pits, but the area surrounding it, it was covered in a light mist that made it a little eerie due to the trees limiting our vision outside of the campground. Why is it so misty? My mother asked with worry on her face. Do you think it's going to rain? My father shook his head while gently parking across the site. Nah, the forecast didn't show any signs of rain. It's probably the mist coming in from the lake nearby since it's still early morning. How far away are we from home? I asked, looking around at the trees. And the trees looked much different than the ones that surrounded our house. These were taller and looked like pine trees. We're not that far from home. Maybe 30 minutes away. Why? My father asked while putting his phone away. Well, the trees are different. Oh, I didn't notice, my mother replied. All right, come help me get out the supplies and set up the tent. Hey, where is everyone? My mother asked. What do you mean? It's completely empty. You would think there would be other people around here. Who knows, maybe a lot of people don't camp around here. Regardless, we're here now so we should set up the tent. 
My father stated, his tone had turning serious. All right. My mother motioned me to help her move the poles around, and while she took out the plastic flaps of the tent. It took us a bit, but we managed to set up the tent when my father set up a fire on one of the camp grills. He started to grill some meats when my mother interrupted him. Wait, aren't there bears or something? I think I read somewhere that we shouldn't have food on us. Or maybe we should set up the tent far away from the area that we're cooking. Hey, it beats me. There's a reason the campgrounds have these set up. I don't think it's bears that we have to watch out for. My father scoffed. Okay, but what about all the other animals? My mother asked, much to my annoyance. She just had to keep asking questions. But she was kind of right. Well, the meat is already cooked, so let's eat lunch and move on. My father could never back down, even if he knew he was in the wrong. We ate on one of the picnic tables under the now blazing sun. The area was pretty empty, but the scenery was gorgeous. The trees were massive, but yet we could still see the peaks of the mountains in the far distance. It's so pretty here. I think we should go on a hike, my mother insisted, snapping me back to reality. We finished up pretty quick and gathered some bottles of water and began to follow one of the trails nearby. My father kept talking about the scenery while my mother just asked random questions here and there. I know they tried to maintain some semblance of normality, but honestly, it kind of irked me that they tried to act like nothing was wrong. I felt like my anger was festering and bottling up and I wanted to yell and scream at them, but that thought was quickly forgotten when we heard rustling to our left. You think that's a deer? My mother asked. Uh, I'm not sure. My father's words were quickly cut off by the figure in the Bob the Builder pajamas that approached us. It was Diego once again, except this time he stopped for a bit before running across the path in front of us and darting back into the woods. We stood in complete silence before I spoke up. Diego? I asked my vision becoming blurry with the tears that were forming in my eyes. No, that wasn't him. My mother snapped. That was someone else's kid. He's probably lost or something. My father shook his head and looked around. No, Shonda, that was definitely our son. It can't be, my mother insisted. Before we could utter another word, a large gust of wind blew on all of us, causing the trees to sway back and forth but it wasn't the sound of the trees that sent a chill down our core, but the cries of several people all around us. I tried looking around, but I couldn't see anyone. It was getting louder and louder to the point that it was getting hard to hear my parents. What the heck is going on? My mother cried out, the wind whipping her hair around. Oh, we have to leave. My father grabbed my mother's hand and tried running towards the path back. I ran after them and we kept running until we no longer heard the crying wails. What the heck just happened? I cried out. I don't know, but we have to go back. Screw this place. My father cursed as we walked. My mother was completely silent. We must have walked for at least an hour before I spoke up. Why do I feel like we walked further than we should have? Yeah, I noticed that too. Are we even on the right path? I asked. Kristen, don't be an idiot. The path was straight and how the heck could we get lost? My father snapped at me. Gosh, I was just trying to help. If you want to help, use your phone to see where we are. I quietly took my phone out and tried to open up the map, but he kept saying that there was no location available. It won't let me... I said meekly, trying to avoid another one of his insults. Give it to me. Use this, he bickered. He grabbed it out of my hands and played around with it before throwing it back to me. Frick here. Keep trying. Let's just keep walking. We walked another couple of hours before we could no longer see anything, as the sun was starting to set. And it got dark pretty fast. Too fast. Pretty soon, it was pitch black. 
I was about to ask another question but decided to keep my mouth shut because I was scared of getting yelled at. All of a sudden, the wails started up again, but in the trail in front of us we saw a bunch of hooded figures walking towards us. Hey, what the heck do you want? Who are you people? My father yelled at them. I looked at my mother who was in complete shock as she cowered behind him. As they got closer, I could see that there was something off about them. They were taller than the average person, and they walked gracefully. Their heads didn't bop up and down like a person when they walked. I looked down and saw that they were almost gliding over the ground. They were floating. I felt my body tense up, but I motioned to my father to look down and he bolted into the woods, dragging my mother along with him. I tried to keep up with them, looking back every so often to see that they stood still, just watching us run away. There was something so wrong about them. I looked in front of me, but I could no longer see my parents. Mom, Dad, I yelled out. I can't see you guys, please wait. I began to hyperventilate and I took out my phone and activated the flashlight, but it was so dark that the light barely helped. I walked and walked and soon found myself in front of a wrecked and rusted car. The windows were long busted, but the doors were still closed. I quietly opened one and crawled inside. I cried in complete silence, telling myself that I would just have to wait until morning to begin to walk back to the campground. I just had to hang on until the morning. I tried calling the police, but my phone wouldn't let any phone calls go through. It was acting pretty strange, only letting me use certain apps like this one. I'm not sure where I am to be honest. I just have to wait for a couple of more hours until the sun comes up. It's 8am and the sun still hasn't come up yet. It's completely dark. There's not even the sign of the moon. I stayed in the safety of the wrecked car, just waiting for any sign of my parents, but nothing. I couldn't even hear the cries of any birds. It was like time stood completely still. I couldn't get any sleep last night, so I sat there in the car just browsing my phone, looking at past pictures of me and Diego. Oddly enough, my battery had stayed the same percentage as when I got lost. My phone wouldn't allow any calls, texts, and didn't even show my location. Eventually, I felt a little brave enough to venture out into the forest to look for my parents or even a way out. I turned on the flashlight on my phone and I started walking. It was so dark that even the light of my phone did little to reveal the obstacles that stood before me. I walked and walked until my legs were on fire but there was still no sign of any clearing. It was like there was no end to the massive sea of trees. Right as I was about to start running and yelling, my phone's flashlight started flickering. I looked down at my phone before it eventually shut off randomly. It was like the battery died, but the last thing I saw, it wasn't even close to dying. Kristen, sweetie, is that you? I heard my mother's voice hiss in a slight whisper. I looked to my left, but I couldn't see anything in the pitch black darkness. Mom, is that you? Suddenly, I felt hands grabbing my shoulders and I could hear my mom's arms wrap around mine. Oh, Christy, you're safe. We thought we lost you. My mother whispered into my ear. You should have kept up with us. My father's gruff voice broke the stillness of the environment around us. I held on to my mother's arms as we walked through the forest together. Nothing about this situation makes any sense. Before my phone had died, it said it was 8am but there was no sign of the sun coming up. The sky is pitch black too. I whispered to my mom. Just shut and let's keep walking. We're bound to find the campsite sometime soon. My father insisted. Sweetie, I do. My mother's voice was quickly cut off by the sound of those awful wails from before. It was so loud that I couldn't hear what my parents were yelling, but I could feel myself being dragged along as we ran away. 
I looked around, but it was so dark that I couldn't pinpoint anything in my line of vision. It almost sounded like the whales were coming from all around us now. And we spotted a small clearing of what seemed like a small campfire up ahead. And as we got closer, it seemed like the whales were starting to die down. Just as I had started to get some semblance of safety, it was quickly shattered by the realization that there were three of those figures sitting around the campfire. They were facing us, but they were sitting with their legs crossed. Their hoods were covering their faces so we couldn't see them. I stood behind my mother as my father gently walked up to me, ready to fight them. Who the heck are you people? He growled at them. I hunched over my mother's shoulder to get a better view and tried to get a better view of them too. They were so completely still that for a brief second I thought they were mannequins. They weren't even moving to breathe. Don't you he- My father's words were quickly cut off when he yanked the hoods off one of their faces. It was a person, yet they were wearing a porcelain mask that lacked any features other than its lips. My father crouched beside them and started to pick off their mask. I'm not sure what he must have seen, but it caused him to fall back on the floor. What the heck are you? He yelled. His voice had now changed from hostility to utter terror. My mother tried to shield me away, but I pushed her arms aside and got a look at what he was facing. The person, or whatever that thing was, had a wide smile full of shark-like teeth. But that wasn't the only thing that unnerved me. It had no eyes. I don't mean that there were empty holes in its eye sockets. It looked like there were straight up no eyelids or anything. Yet somehow, it knew to look at my father's direction. I'm glad you came to join us, Mr. Clarkson. Ed said with a slight growl and a sick smile. The others began to remove their masks, and I looked at them. I couldn't help but be completely disturbed. The one in the middle had all twisted features, white, translucent reptilian skin and eyes that were completely black, and that same creepy shark-like teeth. But the one on its left had no mouth, similar to the one that had no eyes. Everything else was the same, though. Ah, uh, Mrs. Clarkson and Kristen Clarkson. We have the entire family here. Well, almost. Where's your son? I believe his name is Diego. The other one spoke while the one without a mouth just nodded. My father grabbed a random stick and ran towards them, ready to try and take one down. But as soon as he got within hitting distance, all three of us were slammed into the ground by some invisible force. My father was thrown backwards and into the floor, whereas my mother and I were thrown onto our knees and the three, three of us were dragged right in front of all three of them. I felt a sharp pain throughout the skin of my knees. I wanted to cry in terror, but I felt too petrified to even move another muscle. From my peripheral vision, I could see my father struggle against the invisible forest, but it was a futile attempt. So, tell me, Clarksons, why is it that your youngest son is not with you? The eyeless one asked, feigning concern, but I could see that his tone reeked with sarcasm. He died in an accident. My mother cried out. Don't lie. The one in the middle yelled out angrily. He turned to the one without a mouth and noticed that instead of the pointy ears that the other had, it was just blank, like he never developed them at all. The one without a mouth merely nodded his head sadly and looked down at the floor. The wails from the forest had started up again, getting louder and louder until I could feel the strong wind blow on us, yet the fire remained lit. These souls of the forest had cry out for blood. They despise the fragility and flaws of man. Should we give them what they want, or will you speak the truth? I could hear the anger in the eyeless one's tone as he spoke. Tell us, what happened to Diego Clarkson? The earless one demanded. I'm real. My mother's cries were interrupted by my father's harsh words. Shut the heck up, Chandra. They don't know anything. 
The mouthless one got up and walked over to my father, putting his scaly claws on his forehead, slightly cutting open his skin. My father winced in pain, but couldn't do anything to stop it. What about you, Kristen? What happened on that day? The eyeless one asked. Tears walled up in my eyes as I tried to recall that day. I woke up late and didn't notice that he had tried to make some breakfast. He died because he had choked on something. I cried out, hoping that it would be enough for them to let us go. What really happened that day? He demanded angrily. That's all that happened, please, I swear. I cried out, hoping for mercy. Really, you saw him choking. The earless one scoffed at my words. I nodded my head. The truth was, right after I saw his body on the floor, I called the ambulance and my parents had to be called in from work. I knew right away that he was no longer alive. His eyes were wide open. What about you, Shonda? Got anything to add? The eyeless one questioned. I'm sorry, Chrissy. My mother cried out. I'm really sorry. Her cries were almost joining the chorus of the wails coming from all around us. What are you sorry about? I asked in confusion. My parents had to work and I was in charge of my brother. It was my responsibility. We knew he had died before you did. Daddy and I had stayed home that morning. We were just a little stressed out the night before so we took something to have us sleep. My mother was cut off by the sound of gurgling and coming from her. Enough lies. The deaf one yelled furiously at her. The more you lie, the stronger the hold gets. The eyeless one spoke. Come on, Shonda. We did coke. We were freaking coked out of our minds the night before and we left some out in the kitchen. Diego got in and overdosed while we were all asleep. It was like time had frozen once again for me. I tried to remember that day again. Every time I recalled that day, the only memory I had was his little body surrounded by flour and random stuff. I was sure that he was surrounded by flour, but it was freaking coke. How could my own parents let me feel guilty this entire year? But why wouldn't they be locked up for child neglected less? I knew they had money, but I didn't know they had enough to buy off some freaking lowlife cops. That explains why we moved away. They didn't move me out to the middle of nowhere because they wanted to recover. They were running away from the truth. They killed Diego. How could you? I screamed out, trying to push through whatever was gripping onto me to try to attack those two. Now, now. The eyeless one spoke. Giving in to your anger does little to help our situation, Missy. What would little Diego say? The deaf one questioned while giving off a slight smirk. That sick idiot was getting some twisted pleasure out of this. Screw you, I yelled out angrily. I didn't care anymore about any of this. I wanted to hurt someone and I didn't care who. Sissy, I heard a little voice ask from my left. I turned and saw that from the woods a little figure in blue pajamas had emerged. Diego. My mother's cries had come to a stop as she questioned the little boy in front of us. Diego, come to mama. Right as she had said those words, he ran to my side and hugged me so tight that I could feel the warmth of his little body. I didn't understand how this was possible, but I didn't care. I hugged him back so tight because I was scared that he would disappear. I'm so sorry, I cried into his shoulders, covering his pajamas and the stains of my snot. I looked around to see that both my parents were still being held by the invisible forest, which was tightening its grip on them. You too will be let go. Go into the woods and do not look back. A soul for a soul. The eyeless one said, while the mouthless one pointed at the woods. The wails had died out completely, leaving behind only the cries and moans of my parents. I grabbed Diego's hand and we began to walk through the pitch black of the woods, not looking back at my parents. We walked and walked until we could no longer see the faint light of that campfire. We must have walked a while before I noticed that the sun had started coming up fairly quickly. Until soon, it was shining down on both of us. My phone had begun vibrating in my left pocket and we found ourselves back in the trail leading back to the campground. I walked inside the car with Diego and began to drive back home. 
I was so confused as to how my little brother had seemingly come to life. But when I checked back on my phone, I saw that I was swamped with the messages of my friends back home. Christy, I just wanted to see how you and Diego were holding up. Losing both your parents is hard, so please let me know if you need anything. I can drive up there and help you with anything. Text me back. I was so confused as to how my friends knew about Diego's return. But when I checked their social media, I saw that they had linked an article about my parents' death one year ago. They both had died due to some overdose. I know it's crazy, but I remembered that phrase the eyeless one had said. A soul for a soul. Who keeps ordering pizza to my house at 3am? Written by Sheen1911 Okay, so I'm not gonna lie. I'm kind of freaking the heck out right now. This has been happening for the past three days and I don't know how to deal with it anymore. Some background. I am from Malaysia and I live alone in a budget apartment. Our country's been on full lockdown for over two weeks now and my basic life schedule is completely messed up. I'm usually up all night till the morning of the next day, sleeping during the afternoons to the late evening. Rinse and repeat. This was largely okay for me. Being up all night by myself is invigorating since it's so peaceful and calm. The air is cooler and the world is quiet. Most of the times, I just fool around on the internet, reading and watching videos after getting some work done. However, as I mentioned, starting three days ago, I've been getting delivery riders coming to my door at the dead of the night, usually around 3am. The first time it happened, I was startled, sure. I mean, I live alone, it's 3am, and getting knocks on your door at that time can only mean bad news. I quickly opened my door, only to see a guy dressed in a polo shirt with a cap holding a box of pizza. Relaxing a bit, I told the guy, wrong house bro, and tried to shut the door to get back to my business. But he stopped me with a, please boss, please. I turned back around. The guy tried to push the pizza box towards me. Please sir, take it, take it, it's your order. I shook my head firmly and said, No, I didn't order anything. You've got the wrong house, man. But he didn't seem to be listening. He kept repeating, Please, boss, take it, your order, while pushing the box to me. At this point, I kind of figured maybe this guy doesn't understand what I'm saying, or maybe he was disabled in some way. So I took the box thinking maybe the delivery address would be on it or something. The first thing I noticed was that it wasn't the usual chain store brand like a Domino's or a Pizza Hut. The logo was just Gab, G-A-B, and black letters, which isn't a brand that I know of. There was no delivery address tacked onto the box or anything, so I tried asking for a receipt from the guy. But he just shook his head and said, No, 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 no receipt, while backing away ready to leave. I tried to stop him to hand him back the box, but he just wouldn't have it. He left hurriedly, and I ended up with a free box of mystery pizza. Now, I probably should be stoked because, hey, it's free pizza. But it is at 3am. It's from an unknown place from a brand that I've never heard of. And it was delivered by one of the shadiest dudes that I'd ever met in my life. So... I did what any reasonable person should do, and I left it outside of my door, thinking that I'll just throw it out to my trash in the morning. My sister always told me to never pick up strange things from outside. It's the easiest way to avoid bringing any bad luck or trouble, she had said. After that, I got back on my computer, feeling just a tad weirded out but not really thinking too much of it. Eventually, the sun rose and I went outside to take out my trash. When I got outside, though, the pizza box wasn't there anymore. It was a little strange, but I just shrugged it off as maybe the janitor or someone had thrown it out for me. 
And I proceeded with my day as usual, and almost completely forgot about the whole thing. Until the knocking came again. I looked at the time. 2.45 a.m. What in the world? I got up and opened the door. A different guy in the same uniform from yesterday stood in front of me, holding yet another box of pizza. Sir, your order, please, take it. I shook my head no. No, no order, it's not mine, wrong house man, I told him. This time, I managed to just shut the door behind me before he could stop me. I stood by for a few more minutes, watching the guy out of my people. At first, he just stared blankly at the door. After it became apparent that I wasn't coming back out, the guy just put the box down in front of my door and walked away. Satisfied, I went back to my desk and sat back down, grumbling to myself about how bizarre and annoying it is to have this happen twice. And did some troll find my address and was pranking me? But the guy didn't ask for payment or anything. Is it just to mess with me? Who would do that and why me? Attempts to look up the pizza place returned no result. Though it is also possible that it is a roadside business with no online presence. While all these thoughts are swirling in my mind, a realization hits me and I feel my heart stop cold. It's locked down right now. No restaurant can operate past 8pm. How could anyone be delivering food at this hour? Also, riders are not supposed to walk up to the apartment themselves. They are supposed to leave the food at the guardhouse for pickup. So then who the heck was outside of my door? A chill shot down my spine. Internally freaking out, I quickly crawled to my bed, trying to calm my worrying brain. It's probably nothing. I didn't take the pizza in and I didn't eat it either. If it happens again, I'll just call security and then call the cops. It's gonna be okay. This is real life. Uh, real life. I repeated silently in my heart, with my eyes squeezed shut, until I finally drifted off to sleep. Day 3, 9pm. I wake up and go through my routine, nervously keeping an eye on the time. I tried my best to get my work for the day done, but it was impossible to focus. I kept waiting anxiously for the knocking to come. The clock ticked away. I stared at my computer, desperate for distraction. 2.25 a.m. Three bangs in the door. Boss, your order, boss, please, take it, your order, boss. I froze in my seat for a solid five minutes, staring at the door. More banging. Boss, your order... Your order, boss. I continued to wait without making a sound until the knocking stopped. I can't say for sure how long it went on. Maybe ten minutes or so. I kept waiting. The silence stretches on. It's an abrupt change from the incessant knocking just a few minutes prior. I glanced at the clock on my computer. 2.55 a.m. It's been thirty minutes since this first knock. Gathering all of my courage, I stepped quietly towards the door and peeped out of the people, hoping that it's all just a big misunderstanding. It's all just a simple mistake, and whoever was outside the door has left like a normal person. But to my absolute horror, the guy was still there, standing straight and staring blankly at my door, holding the pizza box. I gape in shock. All of a sudden, as if sensing I was there, the guy snapped his head up and stares straight back at me through the peephole. I got so startled that I almost fell backwards. He has no eyes. This guy or thing has no freaking eyes. It's just two gaping eye sockets where the eyeball should be. I stare on, frozen in shock. Slowly, his lips started to quirk upwards, curving into a smile so wide that it looks downright unnatural. And then, in a cheery voice bordering excitement, he said, Saatahu, you ada katsana. This time, I fell back with a loud thud and a yell. 
I scrambled away from the door as fast as I could, back into the corner of the room while keeping an eye on the door. This is when the banging started. Boss, your order, boss, your order, boss, and then four more bangs. The thing outside kept repeating cheerily in between the non-stop banging. To say that I was going to crap my pants was a major understatement. I was ready to die on the spot, quite frankly, and honestly saw no other way out of this at that moment. I kept my eyes closed, huddled in the corner of the room just thinking, This is it. I'm going to die here. This is it. Suddenly, a loud, angry yell came from next door. Who the heck's making all that noise? I hear thudding footsteps and the sound of my neighbor's door opening. There's a pause. And then it's back to silence. There's no more banging, no more cheery voice repeating. Your order, boss. Your order. I hear my neighbor's door shut and footsteps retreating. Shakily, I sit up and walk to my bed. I curled up under the cover with my eyes shut tight, but sleep didn't come. My entire body was on alert, dreading when that thing would come back knocking, calling me in that cheery voice. Racked with fear and anxiety the entire night, I was still absolutely exhausted when the first rays of sunlight peeked into the room through the window blinds. I checked the time, 6.30 a.m., I crawled out of bed, got dressed, and walked down to security. I explained what had happened these past three nights to the guard, leaving out the fact that what I saw could be inhuman. I suppose I was still clinging to some hope that it was a mistake, that my imagination had gotten the better of me, and his empty eye sockets were just a slight trick of the light. However, after listening to my explanation, the guard just gave me a look of confusion and doubt. He tells me that nobody has been allowed up to the complex, as per the rules and even offered to show me the security footage, when he saw how scared I looked. When the footage rolled, I could feel the blood draining from my face. It was just as the guard had said. No one was allowed into the complex at the time of the incident. As a matter of fact, no one was shown outside my door either. There was nothing that I could say. I just thanked the guard and headed back into my room. Could I be hallucinating? That could be it. Maybe this schedule is messing up my brain more than I can take it. I thought to myself as I trudged upstairs. As I was about to open the door to my room, however, the next door neighbor steps outside. He shoots me a glare and says, Hey man, what the heck was making all that noise at your door yesterday? And don't you have any manners? Don't you know 3 a.m. is when people freaking sleep? If it happens again, I'm gonna report you. Before slamming his door shut. He heard it too. He actually heard it. It's real. It's freaking real. Now I'm in my room, typing this out. Looking at the clock. It's 1.30 a.m. right now. It'll come soon. I don't know what to do. Hey, so, uh, something happened. After last week, I decided to pay a visit to my neighbor. I wanted to talk to him about the knocking thing since things seemed to have settled down. Also, to thank him for what I think is him helping me out with the whole ordeal. Anyways, that's how I found myself outside his door at 10am, five days after the knocking had stopped, with a small box of mangoes in hand. I wanted to clear off any bad blood between us. I knocked on the door a couple of times and then waited. No response. I knocked again harder this time. Excuse me, hello. Still nothing. At this point, I just assumed he was still asleep. Like I said, this schedule has really been messing with us all. I got ready to leave, thinking that I'll just come back in the evening or something. Before I could step away though, a loud scream came from inside his room. Go away! Go away! Leave me alone! Of course, I was startled. He sounded really upset, so I just yelled back, uh, Sorry, and scurried back to my room. I guess I caught him at a bad time. Maybe it was really rude of me to go over so early, 
Or maybe he knew it was me and was still mad about what had happened before. Regardless, it was quite clear to me that I probably shouldn't bother him for a while. I could try again next week or something. With that mindset, I just went about my business as usual for the next few days. I had been trying to keep my schedule more normalized. Up in the day and sleeping at night. Just in case something came bothering me again. Like the wise man in the comments had said, I can't know if there's a ghost or demons trying to get me if I'm asleep. Plus, if anything did happen in the day, I know other people would be around to help. Everything was normal. Good even. But yesterday, something happened. I woke up in the morning as usual, but not to my alarm. There were loud sirens coming from the window and what sounded like people outside of my door. Thinking there was a fire or something similar, I quickly jumped out of bed, put on my mask and headed out the door. The first thing to hit me was the waft of unbearable stench. It smelled like something that had been rotting for days. It was so pungent that it still got me reeling back even with my mask on. The second thing was my neighbor. I haven't mentioned this before because I didn't think it was relevant, but he was a fit man in his early 30s, very much the kind of guy who works out on the irregular and watches what he eats. But right then, as he was being carted off on a stretcher by the paramedics, he looked more corpse than human. Now I know why people use the phrase skin and bones. He was literally just that, barely a person at all. His limbs looked like fragile sticks. With his head lolled to one side facing me, I could see that his eyeballs were sunken deep into his sockets, reminding me of what I saw at my door just last week. What's going on? I asked the policeman by my door. He glanced at me and told me to go back inside. The rest of the onlookers were also shooed back into their own homes. There was nothing else I could do. I went back inside and tried to calm down and go about my day as usual. But I just couldn't get the image of my neighbor, what was essentially just his bones on the stretcher, out of my mind. What the heck had happened? Is he dead? And that's all I thought about for the rest of the day. When night came, I couldn't even sleep. The whole things got me paranoid again and my mind was in overdrive. I can't help but think that what happened to my neighbor had something to do with me. Or more precisely, the thing. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? The thing stopped bothering me the day after my neighbor had yelled and went outside. Did that thing make him like that? Is it my fault? I tossed and turned all night, feeling worse and worse by the minute. In the end, I couldn't even feel safe lying down. So I sat up and just stared at the door again. It's like I was back to last week, full of dread and anxiety. The clock kept ticking and I kept watching just squirming and staring, waiting and waiting until daybreak. At 7am when it got bright enough, I went down to the security guard again, hoping that he might know what had happened. I'm not sure if it was good luck that he did know, but it turns out, my neighbor had been starving himself for almost five days inside of his house. It was just pure luck that the cops had managed to get to him in time. His brother had asked for a checkup since he hadn't been answering his phone and hadn't been showing up for work. Why was he doing this to himself? No one knows but him. It wasn't like there wasn't any food in his house. But there was something that sat on the table when the cops went inside to check. Presumably the last thing he ate. But apparently it was so rotted they, they couldn't tell what it was. That was what the messed up smell was. Now... Here comes the part that brings me here today. The guard told me he found something strange that he wanted to show me in motion for me to come into his office. He still remembered me from when I had asked him about the delivery man coming in. I followed him and he showed me the security footage of the floor from last week. The first video was from last Monday the 21st, 3 a.m. I remember this was the second day of me not getting any locks on my door. In the bizarre video, my neighbor had flung his door open, seemingly quite upset. 
However, after he just stood by the door frame, it looked as if he was talking to somebody in front of him, despite there being nobody. He was gesturing angrily, shaking his head and hands like he was saying no. It was reminiscent of the Elisa Lamb security footage, just downright unsettling. After a few minutes of that, he seemed to stop abruptly, picking up something from the bottom of the screen, and then he turned around back into his house and shut the door behind him. I paled. The footage over the next two nights just showed a similar footage of my neighbor angrily flinging open his door, looking around and going back inside, always at or close to 3 a.m. On the fourth day, though, I saw myself with the box of mangoes awaiting outside of his door. That was the day that he had screamed at me to go away. My worst fear was being confirmed right before my eyes. It got him instead of me. I know, I just know. You guys might think it's just me overthinking, but how else would you explain it? It could have been me on that frickin' stretcher. It could have been me starving in my own house. The only reason the thing left me alone was because it got someone else. After seeing that, I just rushed back to my room as quickly as I could. I've got to leave this place. I'm not sticking around until whatever the heck it was it comes back to get me. I packed up my things now. I'm moving back into my parents' house tomorrow. I can't deal with this. I don't want to deal with it anymore. It's currently 12.52 a.m. I'm still looking at the door. My work as a forest ranger, the previous ranger left me rules to follow. Written by Fog Whisper 7473. I always liked the quietness of nature, and the peace that comes with walking through the trees and into the woods. Also, watching the clear night sky is a very nice thing to do when out in the forest. Seeing so many stars just remind me of how small we really are. How insignificant is our existence? We could really disappear in an instant, and the universe wouldn't even notice. My brother always brought me with him when he went camping, and that's when I discovered my passion for nature. Now, I just like to go hiking or camping with my friends, as my brother has moved out of the country. I hope that I'll see him soon. I really miss spending time with him. I'm worried that I won't have the privilege of doing that, given the situation that I find myself in now. But hope is all that I've got. If you read this, please pray for me. I need that. I won't give specific details about me, as I don't consider them important. I'm a 26-year-old man. That's the most that I'm saying. I'll tell you how I got in this situation. I recently started to work as a forest ranger. Everything seemed okay at first. But the fact that they just took me without any interview should have rang some alarm bells. I was desperate for a job as I have very little money, so I never thought about it. The day that I arrived at the cabin was beautiful. The sun was setting, leaving off a dim orange glow going through the trees. The weather was nice, you know, your typical clear summer weather. Everything was perfect. The cabin is almost entirely made out of wood. Classic, I thought. It's big enough for one or two people, and it looked very cozy inside. I stepped through the door and put my backpack underneath the bed. I opened the wardrobe and put on my sleeping clothes. As I got comfortable, I noticed there was a piece of paper on the table, along with a survival guide and a metal crucifix. Something was wrong. I picked up the note and something felt very off about it. I could feel the liquid running cold in my veins as I started to read it. Hello, my name is Killian Sutter and I am the former ranger who worked here. I don't want to scare you but this job is not as you would expect. You see, weird things happen here and they can prove to be deadly if you don't follow carefully what I tell you. In order to be able to survive, 
This note will be your Bible. The rules that I have written for you are things I discovered on my own while working here. I don't know if this is everything, but it's mostly what usually happens here. 1. If the light bulb in your cabin suddenly starts to flicker, lock the door immediately. Close the curtains and turn off the lights. The thing will come close to your cabin and it will try to enter. Do not panic, as it will leave if it doesn't find a way in. 2. Always lock the door behind you when you go outside. Failing to do this will result in the thing waiting for you in the cabin, hidden somewhere. 3. If you hear scratching coming from outside the cabin, do not be tricked by your ears. It's not coming from outside, but from inside. Stay still and hold your breath. The thing is blind and it won't know where you are if you do that. It should leave by the time you can count to ten, rushing back through the door. 4. While outside, be as quiet as you can or it'll hear you. If it does, rush back to the cabin and barricade yourself in there. 5. If at any point you get injured, clean the wound fast and bandage it so that you can't see any red. The thing can smell it from far away, and it makes it go into a feral frenzy. Also, change the bandage often. When you do that, throw the old bandage in the fire. 6. Never leave your cabin after the sunset and before the sunrise, no matter what. The thing is much more aggressive when it's dark outside. 7. Before you go to sleep, put the metal crucifix that I left you in a direction facing the entrance to the cabin. 8. Set your alarm at 3 a.m. and wake up to check on the crucifix. If it has any red on it, ignore rule number 6 and get out of the cabin as fast as you can, and run to the storm shelter. I have marked it for you on the map in the survival guide. 9. Don't try to escape the woods until your contract expires, or the thing will follow you wherever you go. You have been warned. Some situations will require you to combine the rules, so be sure to remember them all. And Good luck and keep yourself safe. Oh no, what did I get into? Thoughts rushed aggressively through my mind. I was both angry and confused at the same time. I didn't know if the note was a prank or if it was real. Maybe this guy Killian just wanted to scare me. But I would rather not take any chances and follow what is written on that piece of paper. At least until I realize if it's fake or not. When I got hired, nobody told me that somebody left before I was about to get into this. Maybe they knew I wouldn't accept if they had told me this. Soon after, it was dark outside. I was sleepy and I almost forgot to put the crucifix to face the door. And then I went to sleep. The next day, I woke up and noticed a big scratch on my right arm. I was bleeding. I quickly cleaned the wound and applied a bandage to it. I also threw my shirt and the stained bed sheets in the fire because they had my blood on them. I froze then. How did this happen? And then I remembered the rule. Set your alarm to 3am and wake up to check on the crucifix. If it has blood on it, ignore rule number 6 and get out of the cabin as fast as you can and run to the storm shelter. I didn't check the crucifix. I have to admit, I was scared. The list of rules were not a prank. Killian knew something that I didn't, and he wanted to warn me about it. I haven't seen this thing that he was talking about in the notes until now, but I'm sure that I don't want to see it. Not after what happened today. I checked to see if the crucifix had blood on it. Yeah, I know, I should have done that hours earlier. It seemed to be fine. Why did I wake up with a big scratch on my arm then? What was going on? I spent the rest of the day in my bed, afraid to get outside of the cabin to check the woods. That night, I followed the rules exactly as I should have the night before. I put the crucifix to face the door and I woke up at 3 in the morning to check on it. It was fine. The next five days were peaceful and I finally summoned the courage to do my actual job and go check the woods. 
I was quiet and I didn't attract any unwanted attention. Those were the best days. I could actually enjoy being out in nature and relax for a while. I felt so disconnected from the troubles of my life. I felt a sensation of peace. It was almost like the rules had never existed. Apart from the night ones and the door locking one, I was out there enjoying myself. I didn't miss my normal days before I got the job. I enjoyed every last moment of those quiet days. And I'm glad I did because things started to get bad. On the eighth day, I was inside the cabin, reading a book while I was in bed. And then I heard it. Scratching sounds coming from outside. I remembered the rule. If you hear scratching coming from outside of the cabin, do not be tricked by your ears. It's not coming from outside, but from inside. Stay still and hold your breath. It should leave by the time that you count to ten. I quickly closed my eyes and stood frozen in the bed, holding my breath. I could feel the breath of the thing as it was sniffing me. I think it sensed the smell of fresh meat. A quick meal. I started to count. I was about to reach ten when I heard a loud noise. The thing rushed out of the cabin through the door. I ran and closed it, locking it in the process. And then I passed out on the floor. When I woke up, it was almost midnight. Oh my god, the crucifix. I quickly rushed to put it in a position to face the door. Did I fail this role? Was I going to die? These thoughts tormented me until 3 in the morning when I checked it. My heart started to beat fast. So fast that it could tear my chest apart. The crucifix had blood on it. In a panic, I grabbed the survival guide and a flashlight, and I booked it to the storm shelter. I could feel the thing following me, getting closer each moment. After a 15 minute run, I arrived at the storm shelter. I rushed through the door and I locked it behind me, and then I fell down from the pain that I could feel in my left leg. I think that I snapped my ankle, trying to outrun the beast out there. I crawled in a corner and I fell asleep. Waking up just before the sunrise from the aching pain in my left ankle. And then I passed out again. As I woke up, I asked myself, how am I going to make it back to the cabin with a bruised ankle? I improvised a walking stick out of a wooden pole in the storm shelter. And I started to hike it back to the cabin. I had to get help. There was no cell service in the forest and I didn't have a landline in the cabin. Also, I'm not a doctor and I couldn't do anything about my ankle. As I was walking around the forest, I could feel the thing from before was watching me, smiling at me. I was easy prey. I couldn't get away from it anymore. My heavy footsteps were leaving deep marks in the ground as I was getting more and more tired. Finally, I got back to the cabin. I ate something and then I thought of something risky. I planned to leave the woods tomorrow. I knew it was stupid and I also knew what would happen if I did that. It was written right in the rules. I lost the flow of time while contemplating on my decision. And soon, it was dark outside again. I turned on the light and soon it started to flicker. No, not now, I thought to myself. I checked to see if the door was locked and sure enough, it was. I closed the curtains and turned off the light, as instructed. Shortly after, I could hear it. The thing was outside of the cabin, trying to find a way in. It started to claw at the walls and smash its body on the door. I accidentally caught a glimpse of what the thing looked like through a small part of a window. It was tall and it had pale skin, like it was made out of snow. You could see the veins in its skin, that's how pale it was. It had long limbs and big, razor-sharp claws. But the most terrifying thing was its head. It was human, but it was missing its eyes. It had big, dark and empty eye sockets. So dark that you could stare into them and feel a sensation of plunging into the abyss. I could feel the terrible hunger for human meat this creature had and I was scared. It wanted to tear at me, 
rip out my flesh and feast on it. It would be just a matter of time until it gets me. After a while, it left and I went to put the crucifix to face the door. I also woke up at 3am to check on it and it was clean. My lucky night. I had to get some rest for tomorrow. I woke up the next day and geared up to leave the forest once and for all. I exited the cabin and started to hike towards the edge of the woods. I was slow as I had to use the improvised walking stick from earlier. As I hadn't eaten for a long while, and I was gripped by agonizing hunger. I tripped over and I fell to the ground. The noise was loud, loud enough to attract the thing to come to me. I saw it getting closer, and grinning its teeth in anticipation. I was done for. And then I heard something in the woods. A very loud growl was echoing through the trees and it seemed to scare the thing from earlier. And then came a beast similar to this one, running on all fours and the two clashed in a fight. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The monster which came recently scared the other, which was running like a wounded animal back to the thick tree line. I could see the beast was wearing a torn ranger uniform, or the remains of it. On the badge, I could read the name of the wearer. It was written, clear and big, Killian Sutter. The thing ran back into the woods, chasing the other beast. What just happened? I was very confused until I remember that Killian Sutter was also the name of the last ranger who had worked in this forest. Why was he a beast? And why did he attack the other one? I'm grateful that I'm alive and I picked myself up and continued to hike out of the forest. I arrived at the road and got into my car. I called a 911 as I was injured, cold and afraid. I passed out after. I woke up later in the bed of a hospital. There's something clawing at the door though and I know what happened. I broke the last rule. Don't try to escape the woods until your contract expires, or the thing will follow you wherever you go. Now I'm just sitting in the hospital bed, afraid of whatever got out of that forest and is now following me. I can sense its hunger. It wants my flesh, and I know that a door is not enough to stop it. As the hinge gets looser and looser, I'm preparing for the impending doom ahead. I accepted the fact that I'm not going to make it. But I got lucky again, as it left before the door was broken. I feel like it's playing with me, preying on my fear, and it knows that I can't do much about it. As I'm writing this, I got discarded from the hospital and I'm sitting in my bed at home. I know it's only a matter of time before I will see that creature, but this time I won't run. I'm going to face whatever the heck that is. I've been stuck in school detention for three years. If you can read this, please send help. Written by N.S. Lewis It was stupid and immature. I'll be the first to admit that. But it's not like I did anything bad to anyone. If you want to try to understand things from my perspective, there was really no way that I could not do it. First, because his name was Mr. Hillrow. Second, because he acted like an idiot. Always calling on you the one day you didn't do the reading. And then dragging out the embarrassment in front of the whole class. And third... He sort of looked like a you-know-what, with his ring of puffy hair surrounding the bald top of his head. It was like I had to do it. I got Billy's older brother, a previous student of Mr. Hilro, to give me the you-know-what. Then, before class started, I stood it up on Mr. Hilro's desk. I taped a pair of tiny glasses to the head, wrapped a tiny necktie around it, and propped up a little name tag that read... Mr. Hillrow, but with a D instead of the R. At first, everyone laughed. And then Mr. Hillrow got upset and started yelling in a scary way, demanding to know who had done it. 
The class got real quiet. Nobody ratted me out. I gave myself away. I took another look at Mr. Hillrow and I started cracking up again. So, uh, that's how I ended up in detention. But it was only supposed to be for three afternoons. Not three years. The school is different at night. It didn't take long at all for me to find that out. The first afternoon of my detention went about like you would expect. I had to sit there and read that book about the giant whale. It took everything I had not to make another joke. Because Mr. Hillrow was sitting at his desk just angrily glaring at me the whole time. At four on the nose, Mr. Hillrow stood up. I grabbed my backpack, ready to get the heck out of there. Your actions are unspeakably vulgar, said Mr. Hillrow. I thought about the name tag again, and almost lost it from the effort of not cracking up. Mr. Hillrow went on. You will stay here through the night, and reflect upon the proper manner in which to conduct yourself while enrolled in this educational institution. And then he flicked off the light switch and left the room. That threw me for a loop, but I shrugged it off, stood up and went to get out of there. The door was locked. What the heck? Okay, Mr. Hillrow. I shouted through the door. I looked through the little window at the top and saw the back of his half-bald mushroom head as he walked down the hall. You got me, I gotta hand it to you. That's a good one. I've definitely learned my lesson. Mr. Hillrow disappeared around the corner. I stood staring out of that little window for about 15 minutes, before it started to dawn on me that the guy really meant to keep me locked in that room all night. I wasn't even mad at him. He had got to me. When I pulled on my phone to call my parents, it wasn't to rat him out. It was because I had no intention of staying in that room all night. No reception. I hadn't told my parents about detention, but knowing them, I figured they would put the pieces together soon enough. They would start calling my friends who did know about detention. I just hoped my friends wouldn't feel like they were ratting me out by telling my parents where I was. I walked over to the exterior window and held my phone up to it. Still, no reception. I tried to open the window, but it was jammed shut. I looked down to the parking lot below. People were leaving for the day. I thought about breaking the window and jumping for it, but I was on the second floor and it was way too far down into the pavement. Plus, I knew I would just get a bunch of crap for breaking school property. I tried to flick on the light switch, but the light didn't come on. And then, for the next hour, I did something that I'll never forgive myself for. I burned through my phone's battery playing some dumb game. I don't even remember what. As my phone lost battery, I looked up and noticed that the room was dark. The light coming through the window was getting dimmer and dimmer. It started to feel really eerie. I banged on the door for a while, trying to get someone's attention, but no one came. As the last bit of light faded away, I took one last look outside through the window. The parking lot was now empty. Now the room was very dark. I started to panic. I did not want to spend the night in that room, but it was looking like I didn't have a choice. After a bit of mindless pacing... I heard a click and the door to the classroom slowly swung open to the hallway, seemingly of its own accord. Hello? I asked into the darkness. Mr. Hillrow, look, I've learned my lesson, really I have. I'm truly sorry for doing what I did. It was dead quiet, and I didn't see anybody there. That creeped me out, but I was happy to get out of the room at least. I walked down the hall, which was now lit up by a few dim lights up at the top of the wall. I knew where I was headed first. The bathroom. I'd had to go for like an hour, and it was getting me now. I had thought about just taking it out and going all over Mr. Hurdle's desk, but I figured that would only get me in more trouble. I was walking past a long roll of lockers when I heard it. 
It started as a slight rattle coming from one of the lockers. I tried to play it off as just the building settling or something. But then another locker door started to rattle. And then another and another. And soon the whole row was rattling. When I heard a scraping sound, like something sharp being dragged against the metal of the locker doors, followed by what sounded like a low growl, that's when my urge to go to the bathroom was suddenly relieved, right down my leg. It's also when I started running like heck. As I ran down the hall, the rattling turned into banging. Now I could see the locker door shaking, straining against the hinges and latches. Whatever terrible things were inside were on the verge of breaking free. All at once, the horrible sounds coming from the locker stopped, just as I came to the end of the hall. I didn't slow down though. I booked it down the stairs and only felt the slightest bit of relief. When I saw the entrance to, and more importantly the exit from, the school in front of me, I ran full speed towards the door, putting my hand in front of me to push it open. A thunk. My wrist twisted painfully as it impacted the unmoving door. Of course it's locked, you idiot. It's nighttime. I tried to find a deadbolt latch or something, but there wasn't one. Just a keyhole. Why the heck do all these doors lock from the outside? I wondered. As I slumped down to the ground in pain, fear in what was beginning to look like a harder defeat. I pulled my phone out of my pocket. Now that I was by the front entrance, I might get reception. If I hadn't been a dang idiot and used up all of my battery. I held the power button for a full five minutes straight before I gave up and put the use of this thing back in my pocket. I felt like crying. It was bad enough just being locked in there, but being locked in there with a bunch of locker monsters and who knows what else was much, much worse. I decided to stick by the front entrance and wait it out. I sat there in soiled pants for hours. I would start to get bored and even a little sleepy. And then I would hear a noise from somewhere in the school and it would jolt me into full alertness. Sometimes it was a soft rustling sound that I wasn't quite sure I was actually hearing. And sometimes it was a loud, unmistakable bang. Once I was sure that I had heard someone laughing. Finally, it got to the point where I couldn't ignore how hungry I was. The cafeteria was right by the entrance, so I figured I could risk it. I didn't have any money for the vending machine, but I thought that I might be able to get into the kitchen and scrounge up some food. I had always wondered what the heck went on in there anyway. I turned the corner and was surprised to see that the cafeteria was brightly lit. I could smell something delicious wafting out from there. I took a cautious step and was shocked to see Miss Hadley, aka the lunch lady, standing there behind the counter in her hairnet. Young man, she said when she saw me, you're just in time. Miss Hadley, what are you doing here? I asked. It's the middle of the night. The lunch lady laughed. Oh, sometimes when I can't sleep, I come down here and try out a new recipe. And tonight, oh boy, I've come up with something out of this world. I think the children will love it. Something clicked in my adult mind. So you have a key? I asked. You can let me out of here. Of course I have a key, Sully. But before you go, won't you try my newest dish? You look hungry. She was right about that. I mean, I was ready to get the heck out of there. But at least now I knew that I could get out of there. I didn't see the harm in chowing down first. Especially since it smelled so good. I grabbed a tray and I held it out to her. Behind the counter, she scooped some mashed potatoes onto a plate and then put a cut of juicy steak on there too. She put the plate on my tray. Thanks, I said. Let me know what you think, she said, smiling. I sat down and dug into the mashed potatoes. Dang, they were good. Just the right balance between fluffy and creamy, and a hint of garlic to top it off. 
and then I cut off a chunk of steak and I put it in my mouth. It was wonderful, but it didn't taste like any steak that I had ever had before. Wow, I said. This is great. What is it? Meat, said the lunch lady. Well, yeah, I figured. What I meant was, what kind of? A scream coming from back in the kitchen cut me off. Uh, Miss Hadley, can I go now? You don't like your meat, young man, asked Miss Hadley, frowning. Oh, no, it's great. It's just my parents are probably worried sick about me. I've been stuck here all night. Mr. Hillrow locked me in. Another scream. What's that screaming? I asked. No, that'll be Lily, my assistant, said Miss Hadley. She's forever burning herself, and if it isn't that, it's a slip of the knife. Clumsy girl, but has a great instinct for cooking. Oh, Miss Hadley, can I please go? Very well, young man, I'll see you to the door. Just what I wanted to hear. A way out of the nightmare. When I got home, I would hug my parents, and then get in bed where it was nice and safe and sound and there were no weird sounds, or locker monsters or mystery meats. When we turned the corner and the entrance came into view, my heart first sank and then started beating like crazy. Standing in front of the door, with his arms crossed, was the janitor. Except, he didn't look like he looked during the day. During the day, he didn't have a bunch of spikes coming out of his head, for starters, and he also didn't have empty white holes where his eyes should be. He didn't have long claws during the day either, at least none that I had ever noticed. I let the boy pass, Bob, said Miss Hadley. When Bob the janitor spoke, the sound didn't come out of his mouth. I was standing there facing him. And I heard his voice whispering behind me. I'm afraid I can't do that, Miss Haley. The boy shall not pass. And direct orders from you know who. Everything started to spin and I felt woozy. Uh, come on, dude. I groaned. I gotta get home. I'm sorry about the prank, if that's what this is about. I'll never do anything like that again, I promise. I looked past the janitor monster and saw that it was starting to get light out. Even if I didn't make it out right then, it would only be a few more hours until school opened. And then I heard a hiss and I looked up in horror to see some kind of gas coming out of the air vents in the ceiling. And then I was out cold. So much crazy stuff has gone down in this crazy school building over the past three years. If I ever make it out of here, I'll tell the full story. But dawn is approaching and I don't have much time left. I'll give you the basics. Every day around dawn, the gas pours in through the vent and knocks me out. There's no way to stop it. I've tried. Next, I wake up in a dark room, which is actually a sort of sub-basement dug into the basement floor and covered with a hidden hatch door during the day. That night, the hatch opens, and I am free to wander the halls of the school if I choose. I never want to, but I have needs. I need to eat and use the bathroom. I need to shower in the locker room. I need to wash my clothes. I need to try and find a way out of this nightmare, even if it looks more and more like there is no way out. Plus, as bad as it is out in the school, it's miserable in my dark little hole too. If I stay there too long, I start to lose it. I have some theories about what is going on, but I won't get into them. A bit of light is coming in through the windows now. It's almost time for my lights to go out for the day. I'm at the computer lab now. I have very limited access to the internet, and it seems pretty random what sites I can and can't visit. I can't read any news, so I don't even know if anyone's out there looking for me. Or if my entire existence has been forgotten since I got trapped in this place. Lately, I've come across this forum. This is, for some reason, the only place that I can read. I don't even know if I can post, but it's worth a shot. You guys seem like you've dealt with a lot of weird stuff. So maybe you'll take this seriously. Please help me. My name is Emmett Emerson. 
I am at CHAS in Claremont, Maine, United States. During the day, I am in the sub-basement if you can find it. During the night, if you can somehow get in and make it past the janitor, I am usually somewhere running away from monsters. Hi everyone, my name is Emmert Emerson, and I am stuck in what has to be the world's worst school detention. Regular detention sucks enough already, but I've been here for three years. Also, they keep me in a hole in the basement and usually only let me out at night. And at night, the monsters come out too. I don't mean that figuratively. I saw one of them take a kid's face off once. That wasn't at my last post, but his name was Jason. And just when I thought that we could team up and get out of this place, he wandered a little too close to one of the windows, and a wrangler got him. I'm getting ahead of myself, sorry about that. I'm just psyched that my last post actually made it through, and a flood of people responded. I've got hope for the first time in at least a year. And does it suck that some of you are telling me that there is no record of me existing online? You bet it does. Is it bad that some of you are telling me that my school burned down recently and that I went down with it? Again, yes, it stinks very much. I don't know if you're messing with me or if that stuff is true, but either way, it's at least good to hear from actual people again. Assuming you are real, this isn't just a trick set up by the school. The lunch lady isn't so bad, but uh, she's a little out there. And Jason, like I said. I didn't get to know Jason very well before he got his face taken. Other than that, it's been mostly me, all alone with monsters for the past three years. Some others have come and gone, usually in a horrible way. But mostly, I've been alone. So, if you read my last post, thank you. And thank you for trying to help. A lot of you offered up ways that I might escape. I've been here three years and I've tried pretty much everything that you guys have suggested. Some of these stuff took me years to come up with, so I'm kind of blown away that you all came up with it right away. If you were here as long as me, I'm sure a lot of you would have already found a way out by now. I thought about responding to all of the comments, but I figured it would be best to just continue my story. That way, you can see more of what I'm up against, and maybe you'll come up with some more theories and suggestions. So, here is how the second night went. When I woke up that second night, I had no idea where I was. I was at groggy from the gas and it was pitch black. I started shouting for help. My voice went as soon as it left my mouth, sucked in by the walls of the room that I was in. I mean, I could hear myself, but there was absolutely no reverb. It was like the darkness was swallowing up the sound. I knew in my gut that nobody could hear me. After a few minutes, the memories of the previous night started to trickle in, and I felt the terror all over again. In one second, I was looking at the janitor, with those horrible crooked spikes growing out of his skull, and the next I was here. I kept shouting even though I knew it was useless, because it was all that I could do. After a few minutes, I heard a loud creak and a hatch door above my head slowly opened up. I wasted no time in crawling my way out of that hole. I found my sif in what I assumed was the basement of the school. It was dark in there, but I could see the boiler in the corner, with a bunch of little neon lights buzzing away. I looked around in the darkness a bit for something useful, but it seemed like mostly junk. And then I saw it pressed up against the wall. I wetted myself for the second time in two nights. I could see the dark outline of massive claws and several insect-like legs. I took a step back and almost had a heart attack when I bumped into an old desk. Where are the stairs? I wondered, not idly. And then the room was suddenly flooded with lights and I almost laughed. It was an old dusty Louis the Lobster costume. Louis was our school mascot. Just this ridiculous, lumbering, fuzzy red thing. I turned around and saw the stairs. I was halfway there when I heard the snap. I whipped my head around. There was nothing there, just a bunch of old, useless junk. 
I'm starting to lose it, I told myself. Understandably so. I gotta get out of the school. I kept walking to the stairs and this time, I heard two snaps and a skittery noise. Now when I turned around, I saw Louis the Lobster crawling towards me. His pinchers were going wild, opening and closing hungry. I watched in a mixture of disbelief and horror as he crushed the desk that I had just bumped into between his mighty claws. The desk splintered into thousands of pieces. I ran, taking these stairs two at a time. I heard a crunch and I felt the railing wobble. When I looked back, I saw that Louis had begun pulling himself up the railing, digging in with his claws and pushing off with his many legs, and he was moving fast. I had made it to the door just in time. I could feel the air rushing behind my butt as the snap of Louis's claws were silenced by the closing door. I kept running down the hall and back towards the entrance. I would break that door down if I had to. When I got to the door, I almost added some solid ways to go along with what was already in my pants. The janitor was there, mopping the floor, whistling away. His back was to me, and I was at least relieved to see that there were no spikes coming out of his head. But when he turned to look at me, I saw those same two empty white holes where his eye should be. Can't walk here, bub. He said in that crazy whisper that didn't actually come from his mouth. Wet floor, not safe. I didn't need any more convincing. No way was I prepared to take on the janitor. At least not then. I backed away, my mind whirling. The lunch lady, I thought. I mean, sure, she had fed me a cut of what was almost certainly human. But at least she had seemed willing to help me get out of here. I ran to the cafeteria. The lights were on, but I didn't see anybody there. Hello? No answer. I looked around and saw a tray of steaming food on one of the tables. There was a note next to it. I walked over and read it. A growing boy needs his strength. Need up, my dear. This is my best creation yet. On the tray was a big plate of some more of those awesome mashed potatoes some beans and some kind of soup. The soup was green, and something was floating on top. I didn't look closely enough to determine if it was a baby carrot or a finger. I picked up the bowl of soup and put it on a different table, and then I sat down and dug into the mashed potatoes and beans. It was all so delicious. I wolfed it all down. Now what, I wondered. The windows... The previous evening, I had been too chicken to jump out of a second-story window when Mr. Hillrow locked me into one of the classrooms. But way back then, I thought that I would just be here for a few hours. If I had known I was facing three years at least, I would have dove headfirst, letting the glass shards cut me up and letting me break a bone or two just to get out. I was ready to get out, and I was on the first floor so I wouldn't have to worry about the broken bones part. I finished up the lunch lady special, or at least everything except the green soup, and I took my tray to the trash can. I decided on room 108. I had algebra there, and I knew that there is a big, tall window in that room. I crept on the hall, trying to sneak past the janitor, who was still pretending to mop that same spot on the floor. The boy shall not pass, he said from behind me. Thanks, dude. I made it to room 108 and I tried the door. It was unlocked. As soon as I had entered, the lights turned on. The first thing that I saw was the chalkboard. There was a piece of freaking chalk just floating in the air, writing out a message, and it said, A is for atrocity. B is for because. C is for child. D is for dared, E is for escape, and F is for, I think you know. I tried my best to pretend that I hadn't just seen that and I turned to the window. What I saw there made the whole chalkboard thing look like a stroll in the park. Standing in front of the window was a hideous creature, with gray and scaly skin, standing about as tall as an adult person, but it wasn't a person. 
It had maybe a dozen arms, like tentacles almost. Like a cross between tentacles and arms, just writhing away, feeling around. The thing had no eyes, but it had a nose. Or rather, two flat, oblong holes where the nose should be, and a mouth. A red tongue wiggled over crooked and sharp-looking fangs, like a worm dancing on knives. When I saw that first Wrangler, at least that's what I call them, I went in my pants again for the third time altogether. I booked it out of room 108, my mind screaming for some kind of way out. A phone, I thought. There's gotta be a phone. I know there is in the office. And getting into the office meant that I would have to pass by the janitor again. But his job just seemed to be blocking the front door, so I thought that I had a chance. At the school, there is a reception desk out in the open, right by the main entrance. Just behind it is the main office, and that's where they do the announcements. I figured there had to be a phone there. I mean, you call the school, then somebody's got to answer it, right? I kicked myself for not thinking it through the night before. I had wasted hours just sitting by the front entrance, waiting for school to open up again. It doesn't matter, I told myself. You figured it out now, and that's all that counts. I snuck past the janitor and I made it to the door of the front office. There was a little window in the door, the same as most of the other doors in the school. I looked in and I couldn't see anything. It was dark in there. My brain screamed, too dark. Just as my hand was on the doorknob, I noticed a pinprick of light coming from inside the room. And that's when it hit me. It wasn't dark inside the room at all. The door was just covered in spiders. Thousands of pure black spiders. So dense that they looked like darkness itself. I released the door handle and I took a step back. I've always been terrified of spiders. In Maine, most spiders are harmless to humans. But these ones looked really nasty. And given all the other horrors in the school, I figured they would probably paralyze me with one bite and then slowly take me out while I watched helplessly. But still, I had to see if there was a phone in there. I grabbed the door and opened it, just enough to have a look inside. There was a phone in there alright, crawling with spiders just like every other inch of the room. The walls, the ceiling, the floor. Spiders everywhere. On the floor, they were probably about a foot deep, crawling all over each other. Just this undulating black mass of massive hungry spiders. Nope. I gently closed the door and walked away. There has to be another way. I wandered around the school in a terrified state. As I looked around, I saw a wrangler standing in front of each window. They were sickening appendages and doing a slow dance, reaching and feeling for prey. Windows were out, unless I felt up to challenging one of those things. The front door was out unless I felt like taking down the janitor. The phone was out unless I could find a huge can of bug spray somewhere. But there had to be another way. What is this nightmare, I wondered. Is this all really because of the prank that I had put on Mr. Hillrow? Eventually, I found myself in the gym. I heard the echoing slap of a basketball repeatedly hitting the court, but I couldn't see anything. Ghost basketball. And the hairs on my neck shot up and I hurried through to the locker room. By then, I was already pretty ripe and I needed to clean up. I walked warily past the row of lockers, remembering the locker monsters from the night before. Each one gave a gentle rattle as I walked past, letting me know they were in there, but not coming for me for the moment. There was an aluminum baseball bat propped up in the corner, I grabbed it and I headed for the showers. I washed myself with one hand while I held the bat in the other, keeping my eyes peeled the whole time. And then I washed my clothes. When I was done, I dried myself off with a towel and dried my clothes off under the hot air blower, meant to dry your hands. It took forever, but by the time I was dressed again, I felt refreshed and ready to take on the whole school and get out of here. And that's when the gas came in through the vent. So, that was night two out of, what, a thousand plus? 
I realize there's not much here to build grand theories on. I just wanted to give you guys more of a sense of what I'm up against here. This school does not want me to leave. As to who or what is behind all of this, I'm not 100% sure. Maybe next time I'll jump ahead a couple of years and tell you about my time with Jason. That's when a few things started to click together for me, and maybe you guys can help me solve the puzzle. Meanwhile, please keep thinking of ways to help me out of here. It really stinks in here. On that note, I better get moving again. I'm going to try out later for Reddit so that I can post this during the day. I hope it works. And I hope that whatever's clacking its way down the hall towards the computer lab right now doesn't catch me. And do something like tear the eyeballs out of my head. It was never good news when the second hatch opened. The first time it happened, Robin Phillips emerged. Still looking beautiful despite being covered in sweat and uh, I guess something else. She threw a crazed look around the dark basement. Come on, I said. We better get moving. Who the heck are you? She shrieked, cowering away from me. I sighed. I had had a huge crush on Robin for three years, and now my worst fear was confirmed. She didn't even know I existed. I meant Emerson, I said. I'm really sorry that this is happening to you. But we have to get out of this basement. There are bad things down here. There are bad things everywhere, but these ones are particularly aggressive. Robin started screaming, Stay away from me. The overhead lights turned on. We have to go right now, I said. Robin started sobbing. What's happening? I'll explain later, right now we have to go. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. A red fuzzy flurry of movement. I grabbed Robin's arm. She bit my hand. Don't touch me, she said. And that was the last thing she had ever said. As Louis the Lobster's a massive claw closed around her waist and cut her nearly in half. And then there was the kid who refused to come out of his hole. I did what I could for him. I brought him food and water. I told him lies like that everything was going to be okay. I did what I could, but it wasn't enough. One night, I woke up and I looked in his hole and he was no more. And there had been a few others, Darren Fleming, for example, who thought that he could take on the janitor. He couldn't. Darren emptied the fire extinguisher in the janitor's face and then swung the empty canister against the beast's head. None of it did anything, and one headbutt from that spiked head was enough to end Darren. Or not exactly. Darren is still here, and so is Robin, and the handful of other kids unlucky enough to end up in this place. They wander the hallways as ghosts, moaning in despair. Even in death, there is no escape from this place. Talk about a crap sandwich. Though I've eaten things here worse even than that. When I saw that second hatch open again, over two years into this nightmare, I thought it was going to be another instant goner. I was at the point where I couldn't allow myself to hope anymore. And it was a terrible feeling knowing that whoever came out of that hole wasn't going to make it very long. I reached down to give him a hand. Even in the dark, I had recognized him. Jason Porter. He had been a freshman when I first got locked up in here, which would make him a junior now. We had talked a few times and he had seemed cool. Listen, Jason, I said. We have to get the heck out of the basement now. Sounds good, said Jason. I headed down to where I could already have my hand around the basement door by the time that the lights flicked on, and Louis the Lobster became animated. Jason slowed me down a little, but we made it out with a time to spare. You mind telling me what the heck is going on? asked Jason, as I closed the basement door behind him. Like for starters, who are you and how do you know my name? You don't remember me? I asked, disappointed. I thought we had vibed. That was a couple years ago, though. I never seen you in my life, dude, said Jason. And that's when it finally occurred to me, even if he or the others didn't remember me personally, 
they had to have heard about my disappearance, right? Claremont, Maine is a small town after all. My name is Emmett Emerson, I said. You haven't heard anything about me. I was a year ahead of you. We had talked a couple of times. More than that, I disappeared from the face of the earth a little over two years ago. The ring any bells? Jason shook his head. Wait, he said. Let me guess, detention right? You got detention with Miss Fathaway, and then you woke up here. Christ, you've been in here for two years? Not Miss Fathaway, I said. Mr. Hillrow. I dressed up a little thing like him and mentioned it as a funny name. But other than that, yeah. Detention, then the monsters, then the gas. Two years of that. Jason was cracking up. What? That's hilarious. That guy is awful. For me, it was just a harmless fart. Okay, it was on somebody, but he thought it was funny too. Wasn't a big deal, but Miss Fathaway lost it. And then she gave me some kind of speech during detention. Locked me in the room and sounds like you know the rest. But if you've been here two years... Gosh. I nodded. And the kids seemed to grasp the severity of the situation at least. You hungry? I asked. Uh, let's set up the cafeteria and I'll fill you in. And Jason opened his mouth to respond but no words came out. I saw the color drain out of his face. And then he finally spoke in a whisper. Is that a monster? He asked, pointing. I tensed up and turned to look, and then I relaxed. No, I said, that's just Lily. Lily came hobbling down the hall, dragging the foot that was missing all of its toes behind her. A tray of food balanced dangerously on her one hand. Cafeteria closed again, I said. I'm afraid so, Emmett, said Lily. Handing off the tray to me. A fire? I asked. Or rats? A little from column A, a little from column B, said Lily. I looked Lily over carefully. I didn't notice any new body parts missing, which combined with what she had just told me meant that the burgers on the tray were probably from rats. You get used to it. Thanks, Lily, I said. Give our regards to Miss Hadley. Lily hobbled away and we sat down on a bench and caught up while we ate. Cell phone? Asked Jason, taking a big bite of the burger. Mine's dead, I said. Yours? Miss Fathaway took it during detention and then walked off with it. How about landlines, like in the main office? Spiders, I said. Maybe a million of them. I've raided the chemistry room and thrown everything I could find at them. I think they've only gotten bigger, though. Internet, asked Jason, at the computer lab. Very limited, I said. It's a crapshoot on which sites actually work, and I haven't found one yet where you can communicate with people. Windows. Never the windows, I said. Windows are out of the question. Stay away from the windows. Fire alarms, asked Jason. Don't do a thing this time of night. The gas, it comes out of the vents every morning, said Jason. That's right, and I've tried every trick in the book, training myself to hold my breath. I've got up to four minutes, but it wasn't enough. Have you tried leaving notes? Asked Jason, like in the lockers. You haven't seen the locker monsters yet, I said. Oh, said Jason, right. I haven't tried it myself, but I saw one girl do it. That was the only glimpse of an actual locker monster that I've gotten. The girl went to slip the notes in the little vents there and the door swung open. This tiny green arm shot out of the darkness and pulled her in, slamming the door behind her. I heard her screaming in there. Even tried to open the locker, but it was closed tight. The screaming didn't last long. Oh, said Jason. Shoveling in a spoonful of mashed potatoes. What about a note somewhere else? Somewhere that's not obvious. I've tried it all. I carved a message into a desk. The next night, I saw that desk down in the basement. And a different one was in its place upstairs. I wrote on the walls in Sharpie. The next night, it's gone. The janitor goes around and cleans everything up. 
I did write one message that's still there, but it's on the underside of Mr. Hillroll's desk. I took out all the drawers and I wrote it there. It worked, sure, but who the heck is ever going to see that? Jason finished his burger and burped. Well, crap, he said. How's the library looking? Not good, I said. I've only been there a couple of times, I'll just say this. You don't want those bookworms crawling inside you. What they do when they get in, it's not right. And where they come out once, they're ready to leave. Ugh. Jason frowned. What kind of grades were you pulling before you got locked up in here? Uh, C's, pretty much, I admitted. Same here. We need that library. We're not smart enough to do this on our own. But the bookworms, I said. Well, it sounds like we got a couple of different infestations around here, said Jason. We got the monsters and we got the spiders. Don't see anything we can do about that right now and you haven't already tried. And then we got the bookworms and the rats. What if we catch the rats and then set them out as bait for the bookworms? I had to admit, it was a brilliant plan. I mean, he didn't know that the rats were our only main source of protein, with Lily being a distant second, and I didn't have the heart to tell him just then. So, it was a brilliant plan, and I was glad to have somebody in it with me, who was eager to get the heck out of here with me. But in a smart way, or as smart a way as we could muster between us. Let's do it, I said. We caught hundreds of rats in a big trash can and set them loose in the library, peeking through the window and the door over the course of the week. The rat trick worked. Soon the hundreds of rats were covered in millions of worms. That was our chance to grab a crap load of worm-free books. We didn't know what we were looking for. We had been so reliant on the internet our entire lives. If we ever wanted to know anything, we would just Google it. Now we didn't even know what we wanted to know. We just grabbed a bunch of books that looked like they might be useful. We got books about spiders, books about the paranormal, books about the local history of our town, books on construction, science books, and so on. While I was there, I found a copy of the yearbook from my freshman year. I wasn't in there. I showed it to Jason who found a copy of the yearbook from his freshman year. Neither of us were in it. We collected dozens of books and in a mad dash past Louis the Lobster, dumped half of them down into my hole, and half of them with his, so that we would have them there with us. And after that, we read. We read and we wandered the school, and we talked. Jason had ended up with the local history bits. You know, he said one day, as we passed by the moaning ghost of poor Robin Phillips, I've noticed something really weird. This book I'm reading, it keeps mentioning this one family is sort of starting this town and sort of running things for hundreds of years. The Haldros. Yeah? I asked, making sure to walk in the exact center of the hallway, the maximum distance allowable from the locker monsters on either side of us. Haldro. It doesn't ring any bells. Well, here's the weird thing. There's a lot of sketches of the husband and wife who founded the town. And then, there are photographs of the descendants. And you know who they all kind of look like? I had an idea, but I didn't say it. Who's that? Miss Hillrow and Miss Falloway, said Jason. I shuddered. Okay, so... Well, if you take Hillrow and Falloway and sort of put them together, it would be kind of like Haldrow, right? Okay, I said. I understand, but I still don't see where you're going with this. How'd you even come up with this? Well, there's something else, said Jason. The book is really weird. Most of the time, it stays the same. But at exactly midnight, one of the pages, it changes. It's the one about the way back history. The one with the sketch of the founders of Claremont. Suddenly, the sketch becomes clear. Not like a photograph, but almost. And it's Mr. Hillrow and Miss Falloway there. Sure as crap, both looking upset. And then, the words change. Jason swallowed hard and went on. It's not about setting up a shipping route or whatever anymore. 
Now it's this weird religious stuff, talking about how God is disappointed in our perversions and is establishing Claremont as the last refuge for the holy or whatever. The violators of God's holy word will be punished for their sins, and to do that, the Haldros are willing to strike a deal with the devil. We pressed up against a wall as we passed a wrangler and Jason finished up. I mean, it's not just the words that change. The whole thing is now written out by hand, and this crazy old-timey talk. I've had to read it a bunch over the past three midnights. First, to make sure that it's real, and second, to sort of translate what's being said. I felt dizzy. Okay, I said after a while. So what? Mr. Hillrow and Miss Fathaway are really Mr. and Mrs. Haldrow. And they're what? Immortal beings who have been around for hundreds of years. And this whole BS school is the way of punishing people who fart in class. Is that what you're telling me? Seems a little extreme. Jason shrugged. Uh, the page talks about somebody else too. Not the devil and not a Haldrow. You know who this person is called. Apparently, they're the one running the whole thing, whatever it is. I thought back to my first night there. The janitor had said, The boy shall not pass. Direct orders from you-know-who. I shuddered again. Good work, man, I said. I've been reading some stuff, too. This construction book's got me thinking. Maybe we're taking the wrong approach here. Hoping for an open window or an open door. Maybe what we do is just try to smash through this thing. If all of it is is drywall and insulation, maybe some wires in there, and then brick on the outside. It's pretty simple, actually. Can't believe I didn't think of it before. Maybe because I knew that something would try to stop us. But if there's two of us, I think we could do it. Sounds good, man, said Jason. Let's do it. Over the next week, we planned it out. We found the perfect spot, far away from any windows, any lockers, and the front door. Far away from where the usual monsters lurked. We figured that would give us a head start, and with any luck, we would smash through to fresh air before they came for us. There was always random monsters roaming around like the hall monitor, which was a skeleton with two huge swords that would start running after you as soon as it saw you, to name one. But we couldn't control for that. We had a good plan, but we needed luck too. Our plan after all that time was really simple. We would each grab two baseball bats from the locker room, go to our designated spots and start smashing away. I still think it could have worked, with the two of us. Everything's so much harder when you're alone. But that night, I didn't start out alone. I went to the locker room with Jason and grabbed two bats. I was scared and I was running on pure adrenaline, trying not to think at all. I was on my way out when Jason stopped me. I've been saving this for a special occasion, he said. He reached behind the lockers where there is a gap between the wall and the back of the lockers and pulled out a bottle of Captain. I figured we need a little courage tonight. I had only drank a couple of times. I knew that it would give us courage but also make us clumsy. I don't know, man, I said. Don't you think we should be sharp? Sure, said Jason, unscrewing the cap, but not too sharp. What if it comes down to a split second? A monster's coming and we've got just one more brick to smash. If we get scared, we don't make it. This is all or nothing, man. This is it. We've got to be loose for it, you know. I don't know if I agreed or not, but after he finished taking a long drink, I had a nap. It burned the back of my throat, and the warmth spread out inside my body. I had another nip and then handed the bottle back. Okay, I said, feeling the rush. Let's do this. Hold on, said Jason. One more. He tilted the bottle back and took two long swallows. Okay, he said. Let's do it. I led the way, my heart pounding in my chest. This is it, I thought. I'm either getting out of here or this is the end. I heard one of Jason's bats tap against the floor and I turned around. He was weaving slightly as he walked. Shh, I said, come on man, you gotta be quiet. We passed a row of lockers, 
and I was relieved to see that the locker monsters were no more agitated than usual. I saw the big hall window up ahead, and once we got past that, we were past the stationary monsters. But we never made it past that window, not the two of us anyway. I heard Jason scream as one of his bats clattered to the ground. I clutched both of my bats and turned to look at what I already knew what was happening. The Wrangler had a tentacle arm wrapped around one of Jason's legs, and each of his arms dragged him closer to its hideous eyeless face. I made a step towards them and I swung wildly. The Wrangler caught my bat in one of its tentacle arms and pulled it away from me. There was nothing that I could do. The Wrangler lifted Jason into the air upside down so that their faces were inches apart. It sniffed Jason through its two ungodly nostril holes and then stuck out its red worm tongue and licked him. The Wrangler pulled Jason even closer and I took a swing with my remaining bat, but my weapon was pulled easily from my hands. The Wrangler opened its maw and sunk its fangs into Jason. I watched helplessly with tears streaming down my own face. And Jason's face was gone. And then I was alone again. After Jason was gone, I stayed in my hole for two days, sick with grief. For Jason and for myself. We could have done it together. I can't do it alone. I've worked it through a thousand times in my head. I can't do any of it alone anymore. That's why I'm so grateful for all of you out there reading this, offering suggestions. Like I said, I've tried most of them, but going through the comments, I do see a few ideas that I haven't tried yet. Maybe I'll give them a shot tomorrow night. Meanwhile, writing this has been rough. I think I'm going to go to the locker room and find the rest of that captain. Pour one out for my dude. I'm going to get out of this nightmare, buddy. And then, I'm going to track down you-know-who and shut this place down. I farted into the bag, and then I sat down in the seat where it all started. My seat in Mr. Hillrose class, where I had gotten detention for dressing up a you-know-what to look like him. I took a deep breath from the air around me and held it. I watched the second-hand mover on the clock. One minute, no problem. Two minutes. Not breaking a sweat yet. Three minutes. There's the strain. I knew I could make it to four minutes most of the time. At three minutes and fifty seconds, I opened the bag and I inhaled the fart. When I woke up on the floor, I knew that it wasn't going to work. Apparently, farts don't contain as much oxygen as I had hoped. Well, that stunk. But good to know. It's why I was practicing in the first place. I pulled the paper out of my pocket. I had written down one of the comments from my second post here, because it seemed really smart and fairly safe and was something that I hadn't tried yet. Someone suggested trying to fill garbage bags up with oxygen through various different ways, so I thought that I would go with that. It was great thinking, but unfortunately, I couldn't make the suggestion work. For starters, we didn't have a shop class. I actually remember my freshman year when Mr. Hillro led a campaign to end it, claiming that the point of school was to build mines, not to turn students into blue-collar workers. By the way, that's how I first came to know of him as being mean, because by all accounts, shop class was fun and easy. Anyway, I just couldn't grab an oxygen tank from a welding rig in shop class. As far as creating a reaction in the chemistry lab went, I just didn't have the necessary stuff. Every so often, I would go around throwing various liquids and powders from there on various lesser monsters like the million spiders in the main office and hope that they would explode or shrivel up or something. And they never did. So I ran through the stock and it always took a while for the school or the janitor or whoever to replenish it. The third suggestion was to create oxygen with water and a DC power source. All I'll say about that is that I shocked myself seven times trying it and didn't get any oxygen as far as I know. But the creativity of all the comments plus the specific premise of that one inspired me to come up with my own idea. If I couldn't find oxygen anywhere else, I would just fart into a bag and use that. 
as you can tell, it didn't work. But after all that support and encouragement that you have all given me, I wasn't about to give up. I racked my brain to make the general idea work. And then I had it. I found a basketball in the locker room and I stabbed it with a pen. I put my finger over the hole and held my breath. And then when I couldn't hold it any longer, I put my mouth to the hole and inhaled. And this time it worked. At first, during the practice run, and then later when the gas came, I stayed awake. I opened one eye a sliver and looked down to see the unmistakable work boots of the janitor. I was slung over his shoulder. So that's how I get down to the sub-basement every morning, I thought. And that mean guy carries me himself. In my hand, I held the wad of old chewing gum that I had tediously scraped from under a whole lot of desks. I heard a door open, and then we were going downstairs into the basement. I heard the creak of my hatch door open. As the janitor was lowering me in, I opened my eyes under the hair and I took my shot. I stuck the wad of gum into the latch on the hatch door, and then I was on the floor and the door was closing. I waited. I had spent three years in that place, but this felt like the longest wait yet. In reality, it was only a couple of hours, but it felt like forever. Finally, I reached up and I tried the hatch door. It was heavy, but it opened. My trick had worked. The gum had prevented the latch from catching. I crawled out of my hole into the familiar basement that I had seen so many times. There as always was Louis the Lobster pressed up against the wall. Out of habit, I started running to the stairs, but something stopped me. It should be morning now. The school should be full of people. The monster should be gone. I walked over to Louis the Lobster and I poked him. I almost laughed. During the day, he was just a dumb costume. But then I thought about what Louis had done to my crush, Robin Phillips. And it wasn't so funny anymore. I grabbed a fuzzy red leg and I tore it off. Take that. I said as quietly as my adrenaline would allow. I tore off another leg. Take that, you crustaceous freak. And then I went for the claws, tearing one of them at the joint, like Louis was a lobster dinner. See you later, Louis. Again, I guess. I felt good until I got to the top of the stairs. Now what? What if Mr. Hilro saw me out there? Or somebody else was in on it? Was the janitor in on it? During the day, I remembered it. He looked just like a regular person. It was only at night when he turned into a crazy demon thing. The janitor, or so I thought. I needed a distraction. I knew that there was a fire alarm right next to the basement door. I opened the door up, reached over, and I pulled it. As the alarm blared and the lights flashed, I hurried down the hall. Sunlight was pouring in through the windows. There wasn't a wrangler to be seen. After all that time, I walked right out the front door. My car keys were in my backpack, which had been eaten by a giant electric blob in the pool room a year or so back, so I had to walk. I stayed off the main roads and I stuck to the woods. I got scraped up by branches and whatnot, but I didn't even feel it. All I felt was the joy of finally getting out of that school, tempered only by the creeping feeling that it wasn't real, that they would find me that they would hunt me down and drag me back. But they didn't. At least not before I emerged from the woods at the clearing where my house stood. Man, that was a good sight. There weren't any cars in the driveway, which meant that my parents probably weren't home, but that was okay. They would be back, I figured. I lifted the rock on the porch and sure enough, the spare key was still there. I stuck it in the door and I opened it up. As I went in, I got the sense that something was off. It took a while to hit me, but I finally got it. All of the pictures of me were gone from the walls. I hurried up the stairs and swung open the door to my room. And it wasn't my room anymore. There was a desk there and a bunch of bookcases overflowing with books. I sat down in the office chair, my head spinning. Okay, I thought. I should have expected it. After all, Jason hadn't remembered me. 
and neither had any of the other kids. Even if they didn't know me by sight or from school, they should have at least heard of my disappearance. So, I should have expected my existence to have been somehow erased from the outside world. I had no idea how or why, but I knew that it had been. I stood up on weak knees and started pacing the room, trying to figure out what to do. If my parents didn't remember me, then what? But they had to remember me, right? Christ, I had lived with them for 16 years. As I was pacing, I saw it on a bookshelf, on top of a row of books. It was the name written in black sharpie that caught my eye. Emmett. I ran over and grabbed it. It was one of those single, burnable CD, DVD cases from back when people used to burn discs. There was a disc in it, but the same thing written on the surface as it was written on the spine of the case. Emmett. I walked it over and I popped it into the computer on the desk. The screen lit up and it asked me for a password. Screw it, I thought, and I typed out Emmett. It worked, and the video started playing. It was a video of me. First, I was cracking up at my joke bit, and then Mr. Hillrow was giving me detention. And then I was in detention. And then I was trapped. The cameras followed me down every hall and into every room. They recorded my entire first night trapped in that school. And then there was something else. It was daytime again. Mr. Hillrow wheeled a TV into the classroom. Today for class, we will be watching a video. The camera panned across the classroom. All the kids looked relieved. Video days, as rare as they were, always ruled. I heard a hiss and watched as the camera pointed up to the vents, where a green gas rolled in like fog. This was different than the gas that knocked me out every night. That was white. Now the camera was pointing at the TV screen. Mr. Hillrow was standing next to it, wearing what looked like a military-grade gas mask. He turned the screen on. A man in an awful red mask appeared on the TV. The mask was like a horribly distorted human face with no eye holes. The eyes were meant to look like they had melted shut, with one down near a cheek and the other up by the forehead. There was an unsettling ear-to-ear -ear grin, and the ears themselves were bad too. One was only half of an ear, and the other was pointed like an imp's ear. At least I thought it was a mask. When the low, gravelly voice issued forth, I wasn't so sure. Mehmet Emerson does not exist, said the demonic voice in the screen in Mr. Hillrow's class. You have never met him. All memories of him are false. Destroy those memories, for he has never existed. There is no such person as Emmett Emerson. He is not your classmate, and never was. The camera panned back to the students. Their eyes were wide open and glazed over. As one voice, they repeated, Emmett Emerson does not exist. And then the video ended. I was freaked right the heck out. At least now I knew why nobody from school remembered me. But what about my parents? And what was this video doing in their house? I tore through what used to be my clothes closet looking for something. Anything that could help me get a grasp on what was going on. And that's where I found the mask. The same mask from the video. Just as something important was starting to click into place in my mind, I heard a voice behind me. You must understand, son. You were never to be harmed. Only kept locked in. I spun around to see my dad. And all at once it hit me, like I somehow knew it all along. He was you-know-who. I felt dizzy and sick and then puked all over the rug. Dad, you kept me locked up in that school. Why? My dad sighed. I had to. The prophecy was too close to fulfillment and I couldn't let that happen. You were only meant to be captive until the portal fully opened, which should actually be any day now. Then you would take your place by my side. You were never meant to be harmed and I insisted that you have free reign at night. Mr. Haldrow, 
You know him as Mr. Hillrow. Why did he keep you in the sub-basement all this time? But I wouldn't allow it. Not my son. Not my Emmett. My dad gave a nice fatherly smile when my mind spun like crazy. Prophecy portal. My place by his side. What in the world? But still, there was one thing that I knew for sure. That school had done bad things. It had taken my buddy Jason and who knows how many others. Why did anybody have to go in that place? I asked. You got rid of them, didn't you, Dad? Or you knew that they would go? My dad sighed again. The school must be fed, son. At least until the portal is fully opened. What portal? I asked. It will all be clear soon, son. Until then, I'm very sorry. It breaks my heart, but I must bring you back to school and you must stay in the sub-basement. Not for long, but it's what must happen. I couldn't believe it or process it. My knees were weak and I felt on the verge of passing out. And that's when I saw him come up behind my father. It was the janitor there in my house, with his spiked head and the white absence of eyes. Come on now, bub, said the janitor reaching out to me. It's time to be getting back. So that was it. I was going to live the rest of my life in that dang high school. I closed my eyes and felt that familiar warmth spread out across my body once again. And then I heard a bang that made my ears ring. I thought that I had heard a thunk, but I wasn't sure. I slowly opened one eye and looked down to see the janitor lying face down on the floor, with a hole oozing from the back of his head. I watched in amazement as his body shriveled up, and then blinked out into nothingness over the course of a few seconds. I looked up and I saw my mom standing there, pointing it at my dad, who had his hands up in the air. Now, now, Faye, take it easy, said my dad. Faye, my mom, reloaded. Wait, I shouted. I didn't know at the moment whether I wanted my dad gone or not. I didn't know much of anything at that moment. Please tell me what's going on, Mom. My mom lifted it up and brought the butt down on my dad's head. He slumped to the ground. Come on, she said. Help me tie him up and get him to the car. We have to hurry. It'll be dark soon. I still don't know everything and I can't tell you everything that I do know, at least not right now. But I'll try to sum up what my mom told me as we drove around town like crazy and gathering up supplies. While my dad sat unconscious and tied up in the back seat. I'll fill that in with a few things that I've learned since. A couple hundred years ago, my parents were on the run from the law. They hid out in the woods in the place that would later become Claremont, Maine, and built their cabin near the spot that would later become the high school. One night, while they were outside cooking dinner over the fire, they saw a strange glow coming out from under a rock. They rolled the rock aside and all of a sudden, they heard voices in their heads, telling them things. They had found the portal. At the time, it was tiny, like the size of a quarter. I don't know if it was a portal to a different universe, or just some place far away in our own. I do know that it was a portal to some horrible place, full of bad things trying to make their way to our world. The voices in my parents' head told them that if they helped nurture the portal, and eventually open it fully, they would be granted a mortal life and unimaginable powers. The voices said that my parents must build a structure around the portal to house the creatures that, one by one, would come through it every night. And those creatures must occasionally be fed. And if they did this, over the course of hundreds of years, the portal would become larger and larger, until one day it would finally open wide, and the barrier between worlds would dissolve completely in an instant. That is, unless the prophecy came true. That was me. I was the prophecy. The firstborn son would place the object into the portal, closing it permanently. At some point, the Haldros came wandering through the woods. My dad was wearing that creepy red mask, doing some kind of ritual when the Haldros found him. They were on some kind of crazy missionary work, looking to set up a school of God's highest word and devotion. My dad pretended to be the devil and duped them into building and maintaining the school for him. They were all too happy to help, believing that they were doing the Lord's work, 
and getting immortality too. That's how it started. For hundreds of years, my parents avoided having any kids in order to prevent the prophecy from coming true. And then they drank a little bit too much one night and whoops, here comes Emmett, that's me. The voices told my parents to get rid of me right away. Obviously, they didn't listen, instead deciding to watch me carefully. And then one day, they knew that there was no longer any avoiding the truth. The prophecy would come true unless they did something. My mom begged my dad to do nothing, to let the prophecy come true and close the portal. As she begged him, the voices inside her head raged, and she pushed them down. My dad thought there was a way to have it all. All he had to do was keep me locked away until the portal opened fully. But my mom was resolved. She wouldn't let him do that. So my dad did to her what he did to everyone else in that town. He erased all memory of me from her mind. He went around the house and removed all evidence that I had ever been there. And it worked. Until she took one look at me, standing there in my old room. And it all came flooding back to her. And that's when she took out the janitor. We pulled up in front of the school. It was dark out, but I hope that the monsters weren't out yet. I hope that they were still on the other side of the portal. If they were out, we were in trouble. We took the keys from my dad and headed in. I couldn't believe that I was going back in there after just getting out, but it had to be done. We walked slowly through the building, checking for monsters, and we lucked it. They weren't out yet. Then, we were in front of the janitor's closet. In the three years that I had been locked up there, that was the one door that I never opened. It was always locked, and there was always this green light coming from the crack under the door. That's where the portal was. Are you ready, honey? I asked my mom, pointing at the door. I nodded, stuck the key in, and swung it open. We were too late. A big hole of crackling green energy was suspended in the closet, getting larger by the second. A wrangler was just crawling out of it, reaching its horrible tentacle arms, feeling for prey. My mom fired but missed the head, and then the wrangler had her, wrapping her neck and her arms and her legs. Mom, I shouted. Do it, Emmett, she gasped. Quickly. I turned to do it, but there was already another wrangler there, and before I could think, it had me. We weren't going to make it. We were going to get our faces taken like Jason. I felt the wrangler squeeze me in a dozen different places, pulling me closer, and I closed my eyes. I love you, Mom, I said. I love you. My mom whispered with what sounded like her last breath. And then I felt the wrangler's grip loosen and I opened my eyes. Standing there with a huge butcher's knife in each hand was Miss Hadley, aka the lunch lady. Right behind her was Lily, but she only had one knife because she only had one arm. They were hacking away at the wrangler that had begun ready to attack me. Nasty old things, said Miss Hadley. Aren't they, Lily? Yes, ma'am, said Lily. I reckon they would make a fine stew, though. I had one chance. I pulled the object from my pocket, but I still called it what got me in trouble in the very beginning. I shoved it, still dressed in its tiny glasses and tiny necktie, into the crackling green hole. There was a terrible shriek unlike anything I had ever heard. The portal grew massive and bright for a second, and then shrunk away into nothingness. It was gone. I looked over to my mom and saw the wrangler shrivel up and disappear. She was in rough shape but alive. I slumped to the ground in relief. We had done it. We had closed the portal for good. I wish I could call that the end, but it's not. There are portals like this all over the world. Once the portal at the high school closed, the voices in my dad's head lost most of their power. He can't believe that he locked me in that school. But it wasn't him. And it took a whole lot of willpower just to keep him from attacking me. The voices are still there, whispering echoes from other portals. We're going to find them and close them all. But now that the strongest voices are gone, my parents have also lost their immortality. I really shouldn't be posting this at all, but I couldn't leave you all hanging, thinking that I was still stuck in the school. 
After this, I do have to go in the DL for a while, so this will be my final update, at least for the foreseeable future. I do have one more thing to tell you. We're on our way to meet up with another team. There's a kid there. You might know him as Calvin Dunlop. He posted his story here a few months back. Apparently, the groups that he's been fighting have been deep in this whole thing too, so we're teaming up. Calvin wants you to know that he's doing just fine. He wishes that he could update you, but it's too dangerous. I know it's dangerous, but like I said, I had to get this last one out to you. Calvin says that you guys are the best, and I agree. You guys gave me the courage and hope and creativity I needed to get out of that nightmare. And if I hadn't, and that portal had fully opened, well, that probably would have meant the end of the world. So, you guys literally saved the world. Thanks. Thank you all for listening to today's stories. I hope you enjoyed them. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe and sound, and as always, stay creepy.